You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. And today we are, this is the last episode about Doctor Who. This is it? This is it. We're wrapping it up. We're covering all of the cards that can go in your library. We've talked a lot about commanders in the 99. Now we're talking about the brand new cards that can go in your decks. We're not going to cover all of them. We're going to cover the ones that you'll see the most or that are most interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, if covering all cards would take forever. Mm. So, But first, of course, if you want to get your hands on any of the cards we're about to talk about or any other cards from Doctor Who, just go to cardkingdom.com slash command. That is the best place to go to get your magic products, singles, every, anything at all. Your magic players, you can buy magic cards. May as well use our affiliate link when you do, because not only are you getting the cards that you need, you also are ordering from a huge magic e-retailer that has a ginormous inventory. So they're going to have all of the cards you're looking for. And my favorite part about it is all those cards, they come in one convenient package so that you don't get them in 20 different pieces and you're not waiting on the last couple to arrive. You add everything to the cart, you check out. They all they put it in one package. It gets to you quickly, and you can just leave it up and uh, start playing your deck. So again, cardkingdom.com slash command, the best place to go to get all your magic stuff. Bookmark it, add it to your favorites. And while you're doing that, add this link as well. It's ultrapro.com slash command. Ultrapro is the best place to get magic accessories, to get deck boxes, sleeves, binders, play mats. Uh, Ultrapro has some of the highest quality products in the business. Plus, they have really great sales every so often when you get an email that's like 60% off the, the whole website. The <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I got it. I guess I need deck boxes right now. Uh, I also love their satin cubes. They're really sta- sturdy. So I know that when I travel, my decks are going to be safe and that TSA is going to know exactly how to open them and not dump them all over the floor <laughs> when I inevitably get stopped. Plus, they have some really cool new sleeves called Apex Sleeves. Yeah, they've uh, been working on these for years. Yeah. Um, they really wanted to create uh, a sleeve formula that allowed you to print on one side because printed sleeves are notoriously sort of like unreliable. Finicky, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think they cracked it. Uh, we've, They're really sweet. We've got a ton of them here and they, the printing looks great and the sleeve quality feels like pro glossy clips. Like this, the shuffle quality is great. Mm-hmm. They're super sturdy. I've seen the machines. They've showed us videos of the machines they use to test the sleeves that measure the amount of pounds of force that they will, <laughs> uh, that, that they can handle before they break. And it's it's pretty impressive. Like they, they definitely put it through the paces and, and did all the work. So Apex leaves very exciting. They're coming up. I don't know if they're yeah. They're not out quite yet. I don't think. Maybe but we'll be soon. Yeah. yeah, there'll um, be a link in the show notes if you want to learn more about it. And I'm looking forward to it. Again, ultrapro.com/slash/command. And of course, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. Mm-hmm. You can join our community. You can uh, interact with Rachel, myself, Jimmy, the rest of our team on Discord. We also do all kinds of uh, special perks at the different tiers. One of the perks that all patrons get is watching game nights and extra turns earlier than the general public. You no watch- ads. Yeah, you can see it ad free. So if you want to join our community and support our content, we really appreciate everybody that does. Again, patreon.com slash command zone. And if you want to join our community even more, we're on TikTok now. All right. So go to TikTok. Follow us there. We're posting uh, TikToks of all of our podcasts, of gameplay. Um, we're really excited to have some new vertical videos. Yeah. Coming out. We're hoping to do some custom content uh, yeah. specifically for TikToks and shorts and things like that soon. So yeah, give us a follow. I think you're going to find that to be uh, to make your life a little bit happier, maybe. Yeah. Okay. And every single episode, we shout out one lucky patron. And this one is dedicated to... to- Dylan Howard. Dylan, Dylan, you rock. You definitely rock. You got that superhero two first names. Yeah, thing going absolutely. On. Yeah. Very, it's Dylan very like, all American. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's get into our main topic here the cards that matter in the 99 from the Doctor Who product. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we said this is a start, but just to reiterate, we're not going to do all of them. We're just going to do the highlights, the ones we think are going to make the biggest splash in the format or are the most interesting. Yeah. Uh, starting for with this in, this first one, it is a six drop, but it is very powerful. Yeah, it's super interesting. Uh, it's called Auton. Auton? Yeah. Auton Soldier. I got to admit, I'm not a huge Doctor Who person, so I may mispronounce some things. I, I have seen this episode, though. Oh, okay. This was the first episode of New Who. Okay. Uh, oh, this is the one with the mannequin? Well, I think this I've is the mannequin one, right? Well. I don't know if it, it is. It looks like it. It looks like it. Okay. Auton Soldier. 
Four, blue, blue. For a zero, zero, artifact creature, alien soldier says, you may have Auton soldier enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it isn't legendary. Big, that's the kicker. Is an artifact in addition to its other types and has myriad. So myriad as whenever it attacks for each opponent other than the defending player, you may put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking that player or a planeswalker they control, exile the tokens at the end of combat. So the way this functionally works is I attack Rachel with something mm -hmm. that has myriad, and then it makes two token copies of the myriad thing, one attacking Jimmy and one attacking Craig. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sort of have three of them for a second until the end of combat when the two tokens go, go away, but I'm still left with the original. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to love about this card. Anytime we get to make a, we get to clone a legendary creature is a very big deal in Commander. Anytime you can get three of your, like, probably your Commander, even just for a moment, it's probably going to be very powerful for your deck. Yeah, I mean, obviously you're thinking about ETB triggers because when those Myriad tokens come in, they are new permanents entering the battlefield mm -hmm. and anything you've copied that has an enter the battlefield trigger, you will now get that two more times. That tends to be very, very powerful. This is six mana, so, you know, you kind of... It better be powerful. Yeah. Um, some cards I think this is pretty good with, uh, Terror of the Peaks comes to mind. Yeah. Because that means you have a Terror of the Peaks, so the Terror of the Peaks copy enters, deals five to something. Mm -hmm. Then when you go to attack, you make two more Terror of the Peaks. It sees the other two. And those two see each other. Yep, so three so triggers. two, four, five, six more triggers. Ooh, yeah, so, so you're dealing 30 more damage out right there. That's seems pretty okay. cool. Seems okay. Yeah. Reaper King would work in a similar way, except for instead of the damage, you would just destroy things. <laughs> and Reaper King see all the scarecrows, so one comes in, you destroy something. Then another two come in, and you destroy six, you destroy six more things. Yeah, that's pretty Reaper good. Reaper King is so wild. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that one has blue in it, whereas uh, Terror of the Peaks, you the, know, yeah. you'd have to be in a red and blue deck, obviously. Something else that we were talking about with this card is it's even more powerful if you're cloning something with haste. Yeah. Because it means you go immediately from having one to having three. Because if you have to clone this for six mana and you have one clone and then pass and wait until it comes around to get the full six mana out no of it. No one's going to let you do it. It feels really, really slow. But if you're cloning something uh, that has haste on it, if you have like a Zergo and Ojitai deck or like a deck that's really built around haste, like a Goro Goro and Satoru, uh, then you're doing big explosive things and you're getting a ton of clones immediately the turn that you cast it. Yeah, if your commander has haste and has blue, yeah. then I think this is a pretty good include in your deck, mm. almost certainly, just because you're going to be able to, you know, get the value now and guarantee, sort of guarantee, you can find a spot generally where it's pretty safe to do this, probably. Right. Um, if you have a sack outlet plus this, I think it gets even a little better because the mm -hmm. Myriad tokens go away at the end of combat. They get exiled. Yeah, yeah, but you do have the ability to sack them before end of combat, and you can actually even wait for them to deal the damage and then sack them. So you can get the full you know, value out of it. And so even something like Cormella, Glamour Thief, I think would be possibly a good include for Auton Soldier or vice versa, you get what mm -hmm. I said? Because when Cormella dies, you can return target instant or sorcery card from your river to your hand. And so if you had a sack outlet, and I'm assuming in a Cormella deck you will because you want to yeah. control that, then you can, you know, has haste, attacks, mm -hmm. and then you go, oh cool, sacrifice the other two tokens get two instants and or searches yeah. back yeah that seems pretty good and then you still have Corm two cormelas on the battlefield hypothetically if yeah. the auton soldier survives combat yeah exactly seems good so yeah i think haste is a real key component to mm -hmm. whether or not you were in crew this card because i agree with you i mean nobody really plays with progenitor mimic and other similar cards yeah the six mana clones i was looking at them and and it was like progenitor mimic it hasn't seen play in years in years it's, it used to be yeah. kind of strong but yeah it just never survives till your upkeep so you yeah. never get the second so you get copy. like <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't, it enters as, so you get the one clone and you're like, yeah, but there's two mana clones. Why would I play the six mana clone that I have to untap to get value out of? Yep. So Kashima's protege is closer because it has flash mm. uh, and, and has cascade. So there's a little bit more value in it. But even Sakashima's protege doesn't see a lot of play unless you're playing specifically a clone deck or playing specifically a flash deck. Yeah. Six is just so much mana to yeah. leave open, right? So yeah. Yeah. Sublime Epiphany is another one you have down there, which, can, you know, one of its modes can clone something at yeah. instant speed. It's not a clone exactly. You're playing playing it for the counters and the draw and the bounce. Definitely this does see play, but yeah, you're right. It's not, yeah. the, the clone is incidental value. It's right. Like, yeah, I'll clone stuff because I can, but like, I, that's not but why I'm But I'm also I'm doing all yeah. this other stuff. Exactly. So In fact, yeah. you normally wouldn't play it just to clone something. You would wait for a spot where you're like, Absolutely. I'm going to counter this 
and close anything and draw something. You right. Know, yeah. The thing we always have to mention when there is a myriad trigger or something that says, you know, at end of turn sacrifice or whatever is you, there are ways to keep these tokens forever. And the main way is Sundial of the Infinite. Mm hmm. So this is when all of the Myriad token exile triggers go on the stack, you end the turn with the Sundial of the Infinite. Note, you do not get any of your end step triggers, you don't get any of your second main phase, but you do get to keep the clones of your commander or other legendary creature that you just made. And you do have to spend six on this, so unlikely that you're going to have more to do that turn. So I, I think I would amend that. If your commander is in blue and has haste, mm -hmm. Auton Soldier seems like a good thing to consider. Yeah. Also, if you are running Sundial of the Infinite already and a couple more end the turn effects, like your deck wants to end the turn, mm -hmm. then it's another thing I would think about because then you can get that out of value because you're already doing the thing that it wants. Because there's a, a number of instants and or sorceries that will also end the turn. So yeah. I, we say this all the time in the, in the 99 episodes, but I like to reiterate it, which is like you don't build your deck around Auton Soldier. You right. try and find a deck that's like Auton Soldier will be good in. And the signposts that tell you whether it will be good in are sort of those things, the haste and the ending the turns. Cool. Okay. Let's move on to this next one. It is super sweet and got a lot of hype when it was released. It's bigger on the inside. Three red green for an enchantment aura. It enchants either an artifact or a land. Enchanted permanent has tap target player adds two mana of any one color. The next spell they cast this turn has cascade. So when they cast it, they're going to go through their deck to find the next spell that costs less than that. Cast that spell for free. So, this can only go on an artifact or a land. Yep. Which is funky. Yeah. I mean, going on a land's kind of bad because it mm. ostensibly costs you a mana now. Yeah. Now now you're down a mana because you're tapping it for two mana. Yeah. So you really want this on something that doesn't tap to make mana. You want this to be ramp. Yeah, you really want this to be on something, yeah, that you don't care if it's tapped or untapped otherwise. So, yeah. equipment immediately comes to mind. For sure. Just because... Equipment doesn't care if it's tapped or not. Mm -hmm. So that's just value that costs you nothing, right? I tap my skull clamp. I can still equip it. It still does what it did. It doesn't matter if it's tapped or untapped. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really, you know, if you've got a lot of equipment, you're in gruel or you're touching green and red, this becomes a lot better. Because if your plan is to put it on a land, it's quite a bit worse. The difference between one mana to do, some, to do something and no mana to do something. Like this either adds two mana or adds one mana and two is just a lot better. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Craig did something really clever and put it on clue token. Yes. Um, just a, a sort of a throwaway artifact where you can just make this sort of live on its own. Is, I still uh, think, you know, that still does cost you a little bit, right? The clue can't be used. Yeah. You do have to tap it to sacrifice it. But yeah, if you're making a lot of incidental tokens, food tokens, I'd say, are at the top of that list. Of for like, sure. That you're not Often just don't care it. as yeah. much. Yeah. Medallions come to mind as Love that. other ones because mm -hmm. they, again, don't care if they're tapped or not urza's incubator herald's horn these are other cards that like they're going to give you a discount on everything you play they're going to have some other effect but again there's no tapping involved but there's these other cards and a lot of people don't even know this is how a lot of these cards work because many versions of them don't, don't have, have this. this written yeah but yeah this this was clever you put this down and it's i think this is a really good strong use of this and if you have these cards in your deck i would consider running this card if it's in the colors uh there are artifacts that don't work if they're tapped right. and the fact that you can time when they're tapped means you can get a benefit or skip a downside that affects everyone else. So yeah. a classic version of this is Howling Mine. Yeah, Howling Mine says at the beginning of each player's draw phase, if Howling Mine is untapped, that player draws an additional card. So one of my favorite moves in my Galazeth deck is to tap it for mana, so only I get the extra card and nobody else gets the draw. But now you can put bigger in the inside on the Howling Mine, turn it off for your opponents, get some Cascade, and then when it untaps, you still get that extra draw on your draw step. Yeah, the way this works is you tap it after your draw step at some point. Yeah. And now it's tapped for all your opponent's draw steps. But during your untap phase, it untaps. And now it's untapped for your draw step. And so, yeah, it basically becomes a two-mana artifact that only draws you an extra card every turn. So it's like a Phyrexian Arena on steroids. Yeah, right? it's, like it's really good. It's very, very above rate for what it's doing. Yeah, there's a lot of artifacts that have this sort of clause in it. Usually they're universal effects that you can turn off. Yep. So Blink Moth Urn is one that adds mana for the number of artifacts you control. Usually it's in a very dedicated artifact deck. Yep. Genesis Chamber says whenever a non-token enters, you may also make a mirror. It's symmetrical for everybody unless you tap it with Bigger on the Inside. 
And then... I think the most powerful of all of yeah. these. Yeah. Yeah. And the most brutal, the most mean. And yeah. definitely all playgroups would not be happy if you did this. But if you're in sort of a higher level playgroup play or one that's, you know, a little bit more... What's the word? Um, Spiky. No. Uh, prickly. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, more orb friendly. This winter orb. I mean, some playgrounds are fine. You can blow up lands and you yeah, can counter every uh, yeah. spell and they, they're fine with it. Is permissive, Tolerance? right? P P yeah, I don't know. Tolerant of mean type effects. How about that? Yeah, open, open thick skinned. Thick skinned. I don't know what the word is. You know what I mean. It's winter orb. If yeah, if you're if you're uh, if your playgroup plays winter orb, this can turn off winter orb for uh, you. for you. So way way this works is kind of the opposite of Howling Mine right. in that. You leave it untapped for your opponent's turns, and then on the end step before your turn, you tap it. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe with uh, Bigger on the Inside, you don't even, like, you can just tap it. Yeah. And target player adds two mana. And even if you don't add the mana, yeah. I mean, even if you don't spend the mana, it doesn't matter. You tap to the winner orb so that you untap all your stuff. Yeah. And then it untaps on your untap step. But it untaps with everything else on your untap step. And now it's yeah. untapped for Rachel, Jimmy, and Craig's turns. But And then you tap it again right before your turn. So How brutal. If you like tap it for like a Mystic Confluence or something, oh cast Lord. a Mystic Confluence, have the Cascade, and, and then... <laughs> it's hard to imagine you don't win that game because you just... Your opponents do nothing, basically. That's what happens Here's when you play Winter Arm. They aren't able to do anything on their turn, and you get a full turn. And another full turn. So yeah, uh, there's a few things that do that. A static orb, uh, Trinisphere. All of them are sort of big stacksy lockdown effects that don't see a lot of play in lower power playgroups, but uh, are very powerful when you can get them tapped. Yeah, you need the thick skin playgroups. <laughs> You're gonna people are gonna get salty. Yeah, you know, in a lot <laughs> yeah, of playgroups. Yeah. Careful. Um, <laughs> That's the type of thing that in rule zero you might want to let people know. Hey, I have a I have a winter orb in my deck. Is that okay? Yeah. I have a static Cool orb. Coolest move with this deck. With this card, though, is Staff of Domination. Oh, my Lord, because you can untap it Because you can it untap it. So you add two mana, use one to untap it, add two mana. So not only do you have infinite mana, you have infinite cascades with your next spell. Oh, my Lord. Because it gains cascade, 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 cascade. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> so you cast one thing and cascade like 30 times? Yeah, yeah, if you want. Pretty sweet. Jeez, as if Staff of Domination wasn't already good enough. Yeah, so... The Man, that's worth it, I think... You know, again, in a higher level play group, because mm. this is infinite. This is an infinite. But combo. if you're in a play group where infinite combos are okay, that's worth it just if you have Staff of Domination in your deck and you're in these colors, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think this card's pretty good on its own. It's five mana. That's a lot. But if, you, if you're, if you like, trying to play the strategy where you're dumping a ton of stuff on the board and you know that you're going to have incidental artifacts, like, it just kind of does enough. But if you have a Staff of Domination that pushes it to, like... This is a very sweet combo that it, it gives you a reason to put it in your deck. It's like a Peminzor or something, yeah. right? Where you're just like, it doesn't really do a lot with a lot of the cards in the deck, but it's so good with one or two of the cards in the deck that, yeah, yes, I'm running it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's this is pretty good value. It's five mana. You're going to get two of it back. Mm -hmm. Um and then if you just cascade one time, I think you've kind of yeah. broken even and on this thing. And you hit a three drop, like yeah. then you're literally even on Yeah. Mana. So it's, and then if everything after that is gravy, it's, you know, I think there's a decent good. chance you're going to be able to find a spot. And like you said, you often have a treasure or a clue or, you know, a food or something like that. So even in decks that don't have these winter orbs and things like that, I think you're going to be able to find something to put it on where it turns it into a mana rock that cascades for you. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's <laughs> like anytime you have an artifact that just untaps itself in your deck, Blasting Station says yeah. whenever a creature comes into play, you may untap Blasting Station. Anytime a creature comes into play, you untap this mana rock Oof. and it taps for two mana and you get something else. And cascade. if you cascade into a creature, then yeah, it's, untaps yeah, it, it untaps again. Oof. So like Blasting Station does this, Traxos, Scourge of Krug. There's a lot Final of artifacts spells, that yeah. say when this happens, untap. So if you're untapping artifacts, if you're playing like your Voltaic Keys of the World. Yeah, if you already untap artifacts in your deck, then this card goes in if you're in the colors. Cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, you know. that's a pretty cool card. I like it. The next card is Confession Dial. It is a three-man artifact. When Confession Dial enters the battlefield, surveil three. Okay. And then you can tap it and target legendary creature card in your graveyard gains escape until end of turn. The escape cost is equal to its mana cost plus three other cards from your graveyard. That means you have to exile three cards from your graveyard and you can cast the card this turn. So this is a like one time, once per turn anyway, underworld breach for legendary creatures. Yeah. 
I'm having a really tough time evaluating this card because it, on its face, it says so many things that I'm interested in. Like it, it's a, if it just reanimates a creature, like if you can just ca cast a thing from your graveyard once a turn, that's super powerful. That's on cards that I really like, like Chain or Nightmare or Adept yep. or something like that. Yep. If you discard a card, you can cast a creature from your graveyard. Yep. But it's like feels just funky enough that just I, enough it, it's extra setting, steps. That, yeah, that it's setting off a little bit of alarm bells for me. But I still kind of I want to try it. Yeah, I think this is going to be good index. You have to have either very specific legendary creatures you're going to want to recur or mm -hmm. a lot, just a high density of legendary right. creatures. Yeah, because the cost is not the exact same as something like Chainer, right? Like mm -hmm. you said, additional hurdles. You have to cast this card first. It does surveil you three, so it might put some things in there. Yeah. Um, and then escape is a cost. You have to have three cards in there with the thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in your mind, you're thinking like, and then I'm going to recur next turn. I'm going to recur next turn. Well, you have to have the food, the, the, the escape uh, fuel for it. Right. Which, which can be tough. Yeah. Underworld Breach is an interesting um, comparison, which to me, Underworld Breach is so much better just because you can go off in a turn. Yeah. You can cast a thing multiple times. Yeah. Like it's, it, we're, we can't compare the power level to our Underworld Breach. Yeah. But it, it's just, this is gives incremental. You, right. Right. You're going to be able to, get a little bit which might make it actually a little bit not better but it's going to be le maybe less threatening certainly less threatening and it's less of a one huge turn and more of a like i will out value, value you over time like i will keep having this permanent on the battlefield uh if you have a commander that gets killed a lot and you're playing a graveyard deck this may be very interesting like i'm kind of curious about this in a moldrotha style deck mm. where your commander is very expensive you're already fueling your graveyard and this just lets you recast your moldrotha for six and once moldrotha's out you can recast this if they destroyed it exactly yeah that's nice um so i think it's like in a like a marin deck and like a focused graveyard deck where you're really really built around your commander um, confession dial becomes great, but I'm also really curious about it in my Dihada deck, which is a very focused legendary and Dihada sort of incidentally mills. Um, yeah, you have to have that mill component. Because you I have think, to. The yeah. mill component is like the first. Because it's very easy to just be like, cool, I could recur this, but my graveyard is just not full enough. Right. Yeah. Um, I do. I mean, I like it and I think it's going to enable, you know, some cool stuff, but because it's hard to reuse, mm -hmm. it will sort of keep a cap on like the ability. Yeah. Which is nice. I, I don't think generally getting to a loop where I'm like going to cast this sack at cast it, sack it, cast this sack it is necessarily super inter interesting. So, can you? It's it gains escape until end of turn. Escape cost. Can you do like cast it with escape multiple times? Well, it's a different permanent once it comes in and dies, so it wouldn't see the escape from before. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, that's right. Yeah, that makes sense. I I'm mean, pretty sure that's right. It says target legendary creature in your graveyard gains escape until end of turn. The escape cost is equal to its mana cost. You may cast it from your graveyard for its escape to cost this turn. Yeah, yeah. I think once it goes to the graveyard, yeah. it doesn't have the escape anymore from before. Right, you would have to give it escape again. Sure. Yeah, because it, it does. It's yeah. tapped. I, uh, I don't... But these are new cards, and sometimes we get rules wrong, and this is not something we tech checked with Jamie about. But, but we probably are about to check with Jamie, which means if you're hearing this, it's right. And if you if it was wrong, we would cut it out of the episode, so you wouldn't be hearing this. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. <laughs> it's a super sweet card. I, I really like uh, Confession Dial, and it makes me curious to see how good it is. Yeah. There's a, people are going to come up with cool things you can do with it that untap it as it goes kind of probably too. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Next one. Yeah. So this next one is Cyber Conversion. This it's, one's less cool and more just kind of powerful. Yeah. It's an instant for blue, blue. It says target, uh, turn target creature face down. It's a 2-2 Cyberman artifact creature. So this is a removal spell for two blue. Um, it gets around indestructible. It gets our, like, it doesn't get around hexproof and stuff. Still targets. But it um, locks a commander down. That's the interesting part, I think, about this card. And the obvious comparisons are to other blue cards that do similar things, like Reality Shift is probably the biggest one. Right. It feels very similar, but there's some subtle differences. Pongify, Rapid Hybridization, Resculpt, these are all... We know blue does this, right? Yeah. But those other cards don't necessarily turn off a commander in the same way that this one does. This one reminds me a little bit more of the one that turns him into a legitimate business person. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Uh, the single, the, I'm just yeah, thinking yeah. of it now, the single blue one that comes down and it enchants a thing and turns it into a one one with no abilities. 
because it's a little similar dark steel mutation yeah it's a little similar so it's because it's, it's not indestructible like dark steel mutation the right. dark steel mutation is like ah, i have to figure out how to kill this and it's it's indestructible this is like it's a tutu if they block with it it goes back to the command zone but yep. it does take some doing to yep. get it turned down the interesting thing here like the difference between reality shift and cyber conversion is if they blink the tutu it comes back up on its face. Yep. So this is not going to do anything against a deck that has blank synergy. Yep. I mean, reality shift, that's true too if that thing is a creature. That's true. And reality shift manifests. So if that thing is a creature, they can pay mm-hmm. the amount and flip it up. So there's a little bit of chaos warpish danger with yeah. reality shift. Uh, it rarely comes up, but that is a possibility. Cyber conversion doesn't work that way. Now, if you flip down a, a morph creature, they could flip it back up. Yeah. So don't do that. But any other regular creature it's not a manifest creature it's a face down creature like Ixodron mm-hmm. in which case you know that's it yeah exactly it's if, if they have sack outlets and stuff this is not going to be that huge of a deal or not that different than uh, removal, a straight removal spell right. but there will be instances where it's sort of Song of the Dryads them and they're like uh, my whole deck's off yep and no one's attacking me and every time I attack with this they're like take two yeah and I am going to have real trouble like with my deck actually just functioning now because right. it's all built around my commander. So I do like these effects. I know we got rid of the tuck rule years ago, mm-hmm. um, which was probably uh, a little bit too stringent and too favoring of certain colors that could search for creatures and things mm-hmm. like that. But I do like some ability, some fringe ability to so like phase out your commander, do something like this to it, where it's like, yeah, you can get around it with common effects that everybody has access to, but you might not have those or just mm-hmm. might not have them right now. And, you know, I think it's, it makes deck building a little more interesting to have to think about those type of things. Yeah. Uh, here's the question. Do you run this over Reality Shift or uh, Pongify or Rapid Hybridization? It's tough. Because I don't run a lot of Reality Shift, for better or for worse. <laughs> like... In my mono blue decks, I prefer Mon- uh, Pongify Rapid Hybridization and Resculpt because I just like the flexibility to hit artifacts. Yeah. Or bounce spells if I'm playing if I'm playing like heavy blue. Yeah, I like bounce spells a lot. I've said many times that they're yeah. underrated. Um, I do run Reality Ships a decent amount because I find the exile on a creature to be it's very good worth it. Mm-hmm. Would I trade this for Reality Shift? I mean, it is blue blue, which yeah. is a thing, and I'd say that in blue, it's more of a thing than almost every all the rest of the colors because you tend to want to hold more blue open. Yeah. Uh, at the very least to bluff a counter spell. Yeah, exactly. They just have to think about it. It's mm-hmm. that classic, like, what do you got open? And if they say a green and a red, you're like, I can do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. And if they say a blue and something, uh, and if they say, well, I have three blue, you're like, crap. Yeah. You definitely have stuff. Yeah. There's why would you hold up in that much blue <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. if you didn't have it? So I don't know. <laughs> Is it a cop out to be like, I think I might try it over reality shift here mm. uh, and just see how I like it. Sure. Because I think it's a thing where you're going to have to find out in the moment like, oh, I didn't like, I couldn't cast it here and here because of X, Y, Z. Right. Yeah. I don't know. What about you? I I don't love it. I feel like I would run reality shift first and I like, and I, run, run I run shift. some reality shift, but I don't like, it's in maybe, maybe two of like 25 decks, many of which are blue. Uh-huh. Um, and I think it's because of the blue blue, like yeah. uh, holding open, holding open to blue. I also don't run a lot of counter spells, so maybe that's part of it. It's instant speed, so like you could be bluffing a counter spell and actually have a cyber. It often cramps you though. You've only got three blue. You want to cast something else that has two, and now I can't leave two blue open. Yeah, I just tend to like like spells that that just bounce a creature. Like if I'm going to deal with a creature, tends to be I, just as I'm good just gonna I'm yeah. just gonna bounce it. And most of the bounce spells I run can hit anything, and that that makes a big difference in just like how I can play. So I, I like a flexibility to be able to hit more stuff um, rather than like the upside of just locking a commander down isn't high enough for me to cut down on the flexibility. Yeah, that makes sense to me. There's a lot of one in a blue bounce target and non-land permanent. Yeah, So and I like can, those a lot. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes they play a Planeswalker and you're like, well, cyber <laughs> conversion doesn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I like a, a bounce spell for sure. Okay. Uh, okay. This next one is a little guy. We can, <laughs> we can move through him pretty quick, but I like him a lot. It's Cyberman Patrol. It Just is one. Yep. Yeah, uh, it is two mana for an artifact creature, Cyberman. Uh, it's a 2-2, and it says artifact creatures you control have a flick three, which means whenever a creature with a flick three becomes blocked, defending player loses three life. So you attack with a 1-1, one, one, they block with their 5-5, five, five, they would still take three from the afflict here. Yeah. They probably don't block in that case because they just take the one. Yeah. 
the funny thing about afflict especially on like in this kind of deck i feel like you want just a thousand artifact creatures like this is the kind of the kind of deck that this goes in is the one that makes like it makes a hundred servos right you know? yeah you're making tokens probably and like you said it's most of the time they're like okay so if i block this i lose three i'll take one yeah <laughs> That's the thing about Afflict is it mm. gives your opponent a choice and there's usually a right and a, a wrong choice. Sometimes mm. they're in a no-win situation, but in general, yeah. If your creature's power is higher than three, they block because they would take more than that yeah. anyway. And if your creature's power is less than three, they don't block because they don't want to take the three. Unless the damage doesn't matter and they're killing the creature. That's the thing about Afflict too. It doesn't affect the combat of the two creatures involved. Right. It doesn't pump the creature and make it uh, like harder to kill or, or hit harder. So yeah. a 2-2 two -two will still kill a 1-1. One -one. They'll just take three in the process. I, so I, definitely thinking about that, I was like, okay, it's, Afflict is better when, when you can create a no-win situation. Yeah. And that, I think if you do that, you can do, I think you can create an easier no-win situation with like combat damage triggers. Hmm. So if you have something like a professional face breaker on board mm -hmm. and you're attacking with like five servos yeah. and they have a flicked three. Now yeah. it's a, vi it's a tricky thing because you're like, I want to get creatures off the board and I don't want them to get all those treasures because yeah. it represents mana and draw. So now I'm like sort of forced to take that, to lose that three life. But then you're like, okay, so they've taken like three, maybe six. And They're going to block, the right? Like yeah, they, they have to block. You're just adding damage to the blocks. You're just right. punishing the block. But that doesn't change for them what they what they should do. Unless There's they're a very rights. low, yeah. low. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's still kind of a correct situation right. or not. All this is doing is adding extra damage to them. And I think that's how I think about this card is it is a damage adder mm -hmm. um, in certain situations. Sometimes it's not. Because like yeah. you said, let's say you have those five servos, but not the professional face breaker. Well, then that's a very clear, like, don't block. Yep. Um, which is kind of the same as if this card existed or not. It's just, do they take six damage in that process or not? Yeah. Yeah. It's a funky card. I, I think it's interesting. I think if you're playing, if you're making a lot of artifact creatures and you don't have a payoff for them, it's an interesting, cheap thing to just start creating problems early and start pushing some damage through early uh, because it's two, it's two mana. It's a two mana two, two. If you're playing an artifact creature deck, this is so free in a lot of those decks because it does the synergy that you want it to do. Um, so I'm curious to see what it does, but it does take a very narrow deck for this to exist in a happy place. Yeah. I'm on the other side of the spectrum. I think you're going to find that you're going to play this and it's not going to do gonna much. Do less than you think. Yeah. yeah. It's going to add a little bit of damage at some point and then get board wiped with everything else. Cause the only time this is good is when you have a lot of artifact creatures and mm. that you're already open to a board wipe in that That's case. True, yeah. yeah. I'd just rather have a pump because mm -hmm. it's going to add the damage and make the blocks harder. This is only going to add the damage, not make the blocks harder. Sure. And I need, I'd much rather my creatures have the ability to tangle with other creatures in combat, and that's why they're not blocking and taking right. damage. So you'd run like a Chief of the Foundry, I think is three mana, two, two, gives artifact creatures plus one, plus one? Probably. I think we can probably do better than that. Yeah, Unless yeah. you're in pure colorless, you probably have a Critter Hoof, well, yeah. Master, I mean, this isn't a win card. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. this isn't a, win, a slam but, it, I win the game card. This is more of like an incidental, like, But it's filling fine, the role of increase the effectiveness of my creatures, right? Sure. So I think that is not something you generally want at two mana because that's not the point at which that is very good, right? You're mm -hmm. unlikely to have very many creatures when you play a two drop. So that's not increasing the effectiveness of very many creatures. And once you've got a lot of creatures, you're likely to have access to a lot more mana, in mm -hmm. which case I want my pump thing to be like, okay. Huge and kill the table yeah exactly sure. yeah because a two mana thing that does this is not really yeah the, the fact that it's two mana is not that important to you yeah so yeah anyway it's, yeah i don't love it <laughs> we'll see <laughs> i don't think it's like game breaking but i think it's interesting in like the dedicated artifact creature decks but this next one is better in dedicated artifact creature decks yeah this one is oh uh, i think i read the last one sure. so you can read this one this is cyber men squadron this is so all the multiple. boys yeah. the, the boys are back in town and they are now a seven drop uh, this is an artifact creature, Cyberman. Uh, it is a 5-5. Five five. It says, non-legendary artifact creatures you control have myriad. Uh, so non-legendary, but it doesn't say non-token, which I think is interesting. Because yeah. I, like, I think my brain wrote in non-token, and then I looked at it and I was like, oh, this is great with Karnstrucks. This is sweet. And it's all of them, right? It's, it's all not of like them. pick one and it's got myriad. It's yeah. like, you play this, if you can attack with, you know, three artifact creatures, you're going to make six more tokens yeah 
So you're going to be effectively attacking with nine creatures rather than three. It includes itself. It which, will include which itself. Is good. Yep. Uh, there's no way to sort of get multiple myriads off this from the myriad copy because you already will have attacked. So it's mm. not like you attack with this, make two more of them, and then now you myriad three everything. Yeah. The yeah because the attacking has already been declared when the myriads come in. So it's Unless really you clone it with yeah. the auton soldier. If you auton soldier it again, you get one extra myriad trigger yeah. on everything, but not six but i mean it's still cool but you i was trying to figure out a way to make that thing work sure yeah and uh, you really can't do it yeah this is obviously great in the same instances that the uh auton soldier is Mm -hmm. in that you have etb stuff right so basically the same philosophy right and you wrote down solemn some lacrum baleful strix phyrexian metamorph it's just you have to constrain yourself to artifact creatures that are Mm non-legendary but still it's not hard these are all played cards likely to be sitting around on the battlefield and you're like cool play this thing Attack with my Solemn and my Baleful Strix. Again, even better if you have a Sack Outlet on the board once again, because you can Sack the Solemn. Get the cards. Myriads and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. So if you already have a bunch of artifact creatures that are on Legendary that have ETBs in your deck, this seems pretty good. Because I like the play pattern on this one a lot. For sure, yeah. I like it better than Auton Soldier, honestly. This makes sense in a lot more decks. Because like you're looking at this list of things and you're like, Thought Monitor, Mirror Battle Sphere, Combustible Gear Hulk. This is like an artifact creature deck. This is big, heavy things. A lot of them have ETBs. Like we are used to seeing those cards together and we understand how powerful they are in a deck like this. Also, it's even better because it's colorless and it gives you another like colorless win con that is combat based. I feel like a lot of the time if I'm playing a colorless deck, you it's combo or bust. Like you don't, you have like Graz and that's the only overrun that you have access yeah. to. Uh, so this gives you more punching power in a big explosive turn, which is um, sort of what you need to win a commander game with combat. So yeah, definitely filling a spot. The play pattern too is just so much better of I do my normal stuff, Mm. then I play this, and I don't need any more mana or haste or anything. That stuff's there. Now I attack with it, Mm. right? Auton Soldier's a lot harder. I play it, and other things have to be in place for that to happen now. Otherwise, I'm waiting for my next turn. Cyberman Squadron just says, like, do you have a Solemn, a Baleful Strix, and one or two other things? And then your deck was going to do that anyway. Okay, cool. Play this just before you attack, Mm. and now you get the value. It itself does not need to attack on this turn. So I, I really like that play pattern, and I think that makes it pretty powerful, yeah. We can list some cool cards here. Warm Coil Engine's another good one with a uh, sack outlet. With yeah. a sack outlet. I think Junk Diver, Scrap Trawler stuff is going to be the crazy stuff you can do. It. And like you said, Combo or Bust, a lot of these decks are already built that way. Right, yep. Sack outlets plus Myriad plus that stuff feels like so you're going to be able to... Stuff. Yeah, you're it's just going to so be able to good. go nuts. So... Like, being able to sack two Junk Divers and still have a Junk Diver on board is like... Ah. It yeah. also makes lines so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to break your brain. Yeah. But, but KCI is already your sack outlet that you want yep. in those decks already that already kind of makes this stuff go. So yeah, I think that play pattern of, and it's seven mana. So you're like sack a couple things, KCI. Seven mana in this deck yeah. is Yeah. Cyberman squad, attack with my scrap trawler, my junk driver and something else. Mm. Start the sack train going, you know, and that turn with 20 cards in my hand and in play. Like. Seems pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and the turn with Sundial of the Infinite. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> And now I have three battle spheres and uh, 100 and zillion mirrors. Undoubtedly going to be pretty strong, but it's seven mana, so it's held back a little bit by that, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. This next card is is one I'm weirdly excited about. I don't know. Uh, it's Death in Heaven. Three and a black for a saga. The first two chapters are target player mills two cards, then exiles their graveyard. So it does that once and then again. And the third chapter says, put all creature cards exiled with Death in Heaven onto the battlefield face down under your control. They are 2-2 Cybermen artifact creatures. So... Anytime I, I can look at a card and it's graveyard hate that also does something right. and possibly something that synergizes with my deck, I'm more likely to include graveyard hate because like we're in commander. We need to have graveyard removal to combat the value of those graveyard decks. But putting in like a soul guide lantern just feels like, I don't want yeah. like yeah, it's, it's a whole card. And that's like, all it this does. Could be something <laughs> cool though. <laughs> Like, you can put Bajooka Bog in, but it feels it's hard putting in something that's just to remove graveyards. Absolutely. And this one removes a graveyard, removes another graveyard, and then pays you off for playing your vegetables, which I really like. Yeah. I I think that part of it is cool. It's a little slow. It's slow. That would be my worry, is at the time you want to remove all the graveyards Mm -hmm. is generally a little bit later in the game. Uh, The good news is if you pick your spot and you know you've had this in hand... 
Like, if I had this in hand, I would be trying to uh, take the non-graveyard player down a peg, because mm-hmm. what I need is time, and then I would play this, turn off the graveyard deck, and then I'm going to turn, I'm going to, probably there's, it happens because graveyard is very popular, mm-hmm. but probably there's not two dedicated graveyard decks. Probably think, not, yeah. You're going to turn one off, you're going to get some value off the other, then get a bunch of creatures back, and uh, I think that play pattern makes sense to me as far as, like, where it will happen in the game and hopefully help, it'll help your ability to get mm-hmm. to the part where you get the good part. Right. Because that that would be my worry is like, turn that off. But then I played kind of a four mana spell that mm-hmm. didn't do a ton, like directly for me. Yeah. It hurt one player, but didn't do anything to the other two. And then I could get overrun. So I think if you just play knowing that you've got this and it's like, this isn't enough to turn off the graveyard deck. So I'm going to concentrate on this other one. Right. You know. And Good then, things. yeah, because if you get 10 creatures or something back from this, like, oh, I mean, that's pretty then that's, great. That's huge. <laughs> yeah. And even if you get, like, if you get four, if you, if you, Still playing, pretty good. Yeah. if you're playing against, like, an Octavia deck and you're like, okay, this is a graveyard deck, but I know they're not going to have creatures in it. Like, I just have to close this off or they're going to have a two mana eight, eight on the board. Yeah. And so I'm like, exile you right now. And then the next turn, I'm going to get, like, hit the graveyard player for even more because now they're scared. They can't feel they like can, graveyard yeah. with this on the board. Then next turn, I get, like, four two twos. If I'm playing a blink deck and I can flip those up, if I'm playing an artifact creature deck and I have synergies around them being artifact creatures, this matters. If I'm playing a saga deck and I can just keep nugging a graveyard every turn, this is like, it fills a lot of roles in just a synergy based deck. So like you're casting a four mana spell, but if, like maybe you're playing an artif- an enchantment deck where you're like, all right, it drew, it drew me a card yep. and it's another enchantment on the battlefield. Like it's doing other things rather than just interacting. Yeah. I like the blink thing too. Yeah. I, I didn't really thought about that, but yeah, if you can blink it back to your control and not owner's control. Yeah, you have to be you careful. You flip this stuff up and it becomes pretty powerful. So yeah, then now you've stolen four creatures from somebody's. Creature. Yeah, that's kind of nuts. So if you have enough cards in your deck that do that, and I don't think you need a lot, you know, three or four. Yeah, probably makes the big enough upside. Yeah, this is the kind of card with just a little bit of added upside. I think your average deck doesn't necessarily 100% want it. But if you yeah. have, if you have just a, you don't need a lot of synergy, not as much as like Cyberman Squadron, right? Where you, no, know, you need all. a ton of artifact creatures for that to even work. This is like, oh, well, I, I like enchantments. Okay, good enough. You can play this card now. Mm. Oh, I can blink stuff back to my control. Okay, good enough. You you could play this card now. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely if you're if you're a blink deck and you're looking at this card, you want stuff that returns it to your control. Yeah. Conjurer's Closet, Thassa's Deep Dwelling, Ghostly Flicker will all return it to you. Eerie Interludes and most spells that blink a lot are going to go back to their owners and you're just going to reanimate yeah. a bunch of creatures. Yeah, so don't sort of don't hearth do, and home. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sort of hearth and home, I think, comes it's back owner. under owner. Uh, I've learned that the hard way by stealing things and people getting it back. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got to be careful uh, with how you blink these. But, you know, even if you don't have a ton of blink stuff, they're two twos. The good thing about blink deck, too, is you can possibly blink this card. Yeah. And just reset it reset if you're it. just like, uh, you know, you happen to be in that pod with two graveyard decks or whatever. I'll just turn them all off for the next two turns. So what I really like about this kind of graveyard removal versus something like a rest in peace, which is obviously powerful, like obviously Dowthy Voidwalker is more powerful. Yeah. Obviously rest in peace is more powerful. I like to run graveyard removal rather than graveyard, no graveyard. Yeah. Because then the game stops for one of your opponents until they find a removal spell. And of course, you've removed a player, you have improved your odds of winning that game, but you haven't really improved your odds of having a cool interactive game. Right. And this one removes it, but gives them a chance to keep keep going. And obviously, if you have more synergy to keep it on board, it can be a little bit more backbreaking, but that's synergy in your deck working. It's not just one card that shuts down one or two decks at the table. Yeah, but if you, if you know what they're doing and you deploy it correctly, it can take them long enough to Absolutely. sort of refill that it's kind of a... Yeah, it's kind of Absolutely. over. Absolutely. All right. Cool. The next card is Decaying Time Loop. You got to say it like that ad. <laughs> the, the time loop. <laughs> Decaying time loop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was our ad. Yeah, I was that, like, that was yeah. our ad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what ad? <laughs> there was an ad for these cards? No. Okay. <laughs> Decaying time loop. <laughs> Three to red for an instant. Discard all the cards in your hand, then draw that many cards. But it has retrace. You may cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other costs. 
the big thing about retrace if you haven't played with it is it doesn't exile yep a lot of the time when you can cast an instant or sorcerer from your graveyard it'll like upon resolution it gets exiled but uh the king time loop says you don't like that hand discard it draw a new one you oh like yeah that i don't one? like ugh, discard a land draw now you're but down your a hand, card every time yeah you're getting smaller that's the decaying that's the bit. looping yeah you know it's going towards the middle yeah the looping is the not exiling uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's this right. Yeah. <laughs> this is a decaying time loop. Yeah, so as you retrace, your hand gets smaller and smaller. If you were to cast this like three or four times in a row, which is unlikely yeah, to be a thing you want to do. Yeah, it's pretty expensive to do that. Um, um, it's powerful. I mean, there's a lot of wheels decks. There's a lot of discard matters decks. There's a mm-hmm. lot of drawing. You know, we get a lot of triggers off of yeah. this. Where does this fit into the overall that ecosystem is, of wheels? See, that is my very, <laughs> a very interesting question because I look at this card and I'm like, this is super neat. I, I can see a deck that's like, like it lets you dig at instant speed where like if you have cost reducers or if you have just a ton of mana and you need to like dump a bunch of mana geyser mana. So you just throw it in and you get more cards. So I can see it being a cool mana sink for like a ton of red mana, like those decks. Yeah. That being said, it's four mana. Uh, and that is a lot. Like I was looking at other four mana effects that are like this and they're just, oh, we don't play them. It's like yeah. Shattered Perception has is three mana to discard all the cards in your hand then draw that many cards. It also has Flashback yep. for six, like which you're not paying at any point. The closest comparison is Valakut Awakening, but that's also a land. And it's an instant. It, well, this is an instant too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah, one, and yeah. it's one less mana. Yeah, it's one less mana and it's still an instant. So it's like, it doesn't measure up super well to the ones that we actually do play. That being said, it's just always there. Yeah. Also, if you're in a deck that has a lot of this kind of effect, a deck that wants to draw and discard, you can discard this. Mm-hmm. There you go. And now it's sitting in your uh, graveyard as a sort of uh, you know emergency lever. I love that. That you yeah. would pull. And it's less likely that you've put this in your deck to literally cast out of your hand. But I think this gets better if you have more instants mm-hmm. just to have another option. Like I might counter something. I might, I might uh, destroy something. None, none of those situations came up. Oh, I'll recycle my hand here. Get some st- other. You want things in your bin. Mm-hmm. Gets these two cards into my graveyard. I'll use later and this. Uh, so I think it. It's definitely like flexible. Yeah. And I think therefore playable. And if it didn't have instant speed, it would be a hundred percent not playable yes. at all. The, the fact that it's an instant. That's is, the only thing that puts it on the table. Yeah. As like maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's it's such a maybe because you're like yeah I can see a, a game where I'm like this is the best card ever. I cast it twice. I yeah. like clean up my hand. I mill myself for a bunch. I have Glidenhor Buccaneer out. Yeah. Or I have, uh, you have Alhamrit's archive. Yeah. Out. Draw twice as money. Now your hand is bigger. Yeah. And again, this is the same as a lot of these cards. Where if you have those cards in your deck, this mm-hmm. tells you, and you already know, cause you have this, these decks. And this is a card that's got a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of wheels in magic. Yeah. And it's going to fit somewhere towards the back half of wheels, but could it supplant, you know, one of the, you know, let's say, I don't know, a wheels deck that has eight wheels in it. Yeah. It's probably not better than your top four wheels. Yeah. But maybe it's better than one of your bottom four wheels. Yeah, and it like kicks a, off the eighth one and it becomes maybe. Maybe. Just that flexibility and being able to cast it multiple times is, um, goes a long way. So it's interesting. I'm curious to see how Decaying, Decaying Time Loop actually feels in game. Yeah. Because it's one of those cards that could feel incredible and it could feel like I'm never casting that. I think Valakut Awakening is a really good comparison. Mm-hmm. And to me, Valakut Awakening is sort of a emergency lever pull where it's like, this is good. I'm glad I had it. I played it as a land in mm-hmm. a lot of games. In this game, I'm going to use it to give myself another shot here at finding a board wipe or, yeah. you know, I, I have, you know, just kind of a, a bad a hand that's ill suited for what's going on and maybe get me back into it. But rarely do I play a Valakut Awakening. And I'm like, that had a big game changing impact. But once in a while. Yeah. You know, you draw the right card or whatever. The big difference between this and, and um, Valakut Awakening is discarding is way more powerful than bottoming. Yeah, that's um, true. That's a good because point. you still have access to those cards. Yeah, so, that's a good point. Yeah, um, so it goes in all these decks all of a sudden with Valakut Awakening. Probably still goes in them just because it could be a land. But yeah, yeah it, it actively helps your plan of like Surly Bagisaur and things like that. Right. If you're a discard, uh, like a self-discard deck, you're trying to discard your own stuff. Or if you're trying to mill re-animate. yourself multiple times, reanimate deck is an interesting place for it because uh, it doesn't take up a ton of slots and yeah. gives you a, a big engine. Maybe take a look at the King Time Loop. Okay. This next one is pre-ordering for 
a bajillion dollars. Really? Twenty seven dollars. Wow. That kind of recording. Wow. I would like to say this it's card cool. rules. It's very cool. Do not pay twenty seven dollars uh, for uh, it. I don't think it's worth that. It is not that good. It is hilarious. It's displaced dinosaurs. Five green green for a seven seven dinosaur. As a historic permanent enters the battlefield under your control, it becomes a 7-7 dinosaur creature in addition to its other types. Uh, Reminder, artifacts, legendaries, and sagas are historic spells or permanents. Um, So... But what if I Dockside Extortionist right after this? Then you get a whole bunch of dinosaurs. Congratulations. We broke Dockside Extortionist. You gave all your treasure summoning (laughs) sickness. You probably still... Good job. Yeah, exactly. It probably makes it worse. (laughs) It probably does. Maybe if you have anger in your graveyard, but it probably makes Dockside worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's the funny thing. (laughs) The the weird thing about this is like, yeah, I think this card's awesome. I think it's a really cool finisher in like a food deck, in a clue deck. If you're making a ton of stuff and you just want to turn it into power, Display Dinosaurs does that. It's a little slow. Sort of. This is my contention with it is I think... You have to do it after. Yeah. And that's the big thing. It'd be one thing if you played it and it turned all your food into seven seven then it's busted it doesn't do that it, you yeah. have to make a lot of treasure once the seven drop is already out mm-hmm. so this is again when i talk about play patterns the play pattern on this one is a lot tougher to imagine i play a seven drop yeah that people allow to live to my next turn and then i do enough more stuff like a brass's bounty or something like but then they have summoning sickness yes exactly they can't even and attack then i turn. do that and then i have to wait another turn it's just yeah it's slow it's it sounds cool and it reads really cool, but it's hard to imagine the scenarios. Like you have to have so much things going your way. That's like, well, a lot of things would be amazing in that yeah. situation. Like, okay, I have anger in my graveyard. Mm-hmm. I have a brass's bounty in hand. I play displaced dinosaur. Nobody messes with that. I brass's mm-hmm. bounty. I make all those treasure. They all become seven sevens. Nobody kills this dinosaur with that on the stack. Right. Yeah. They and, also don't have trample. Right. And then I also had a way to give them haste because I had yeah. anger in my graveyard. And it's like, cool, but I can come up with a lot of scenarios where like, okay, well, if I have this card, this card, this card, and then I do this thing, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I don't think it's, a- everybody's freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not that powerful it's you do have to get a seven drop and then execute your plan yeah. which in in commander you really want to execute the plan and, and then, then make the plan great yes yeah, exactly uh and then like uh, amplify the plan there you go and um this yeah you does, want people to be going and eh, they got seven food tokens but who cares yeah what are they gonna do with those seven food tokens yeah i don't see anything right now right. to take advantage of those food tokens and then you go boom all my food tokens are seven sevens ah! i kill you yeah that's cool but that's not what this does but if you if you play this then everybody goes what if he makes seven food tokens? exactly kill him yeah and you're at like the, i don't have it yet <laughs> at the very least they go i'm going to hold my mana open for my removal spell so that right. on their turn if they play a dock side i'm ready to kill it so there are some super cool play patterns that you can do with this card and they are like funky mind games, which okay. I do really like. And I want to mention them, even though it's a little bit absurd to think about these coming down after a seven, seven, seven drop. Uh, there are like legendary creatures that are much ba- better if they're huge. Like imagine playing a Savala Heart of the Wild. Oh. Now she's a seven, seven. Oh, wow. What? That's cool. <laughs> she taps her seven all on her own. I like Holland and Elena partners. I like that they become two dinosaurs, but now they also immediately put seven counters on something else. So because that card does something when it comes down, it speeds up the clock a little bit. That's cool. Yavamaya. Yeah, uh, you Cradle can just of play legendary land. You just huh? play a legendary land. It is now a 7-7 seven, seven dinosaur oh, that's land. That's cool. Uh, can't be bounced by Cyclonic Rift. That's ah. nice. Uh, Dark Steel Citadel is a, like an artifact land and indestructible. Oh, indestructible. So you play that seven, and now you have an indestructible 7-7 seven, seven immediately. <laughs> right now in your artifact land that green cool. deck. That is cool. But it's sweet. Yeah. You could play an Esper Sentinel and it's a 7-7. Seven, seven. Now they have to pay 7 for all of their... Like, there's cool stuff you can do here. That is cool. Uh, there are some weird rules things. Yeah, okay, because I was going to ask because <laughs> we're looking at the cards yeah. and you've got Nissa who shakes the world here and I was like, oh, crap. A Planeswalker will become a 7-7. Seven, seven. Yeah. And then my brain goes, how does that work exactly? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had to ask. <laughs> I was like, they're historic. What happens? And it, Okay, so if you play a planeswalker after this it comes in it becomes a creature in addition to its other types so it is still a planeswalker it is also a creature which means that your opponents can attack it and it can block the attack attacking it but if it's dealt damage it still loses loyalty counter so it doesn't really do anything it becomes like hearthstone 
Yeah, it's really strange. Oh, but if it gets zero loyalty, it's still alive. It's, it's still it's seven seven. No, if it goes, it's a, like planeswalkers have a state based action that if they go to zero, they are gone, and it's still a planeswalker. So like, <laughs> it doesn't really change anything. Oh, because that sword also makes a it dinosaur. not a planeswalker anymore. Yeah. What's that sword from? Uh, yeah. From uh, Nuke the, the yeah, I can picture it. I don't. Yeah. Okay. okay. Editors will get it. <laughs> so it doesn't take away its planeswalker. That's so weird. It's really strange. The people were talking about, like, what happens if you figure out how to make a battle historic and a battle enters? Because a battle can't attack or block. Like, that's just a, a thing that battles say. So, is this a se- it's a 7-7 seven, seven creature that can be attacked like a battle, but cannot attack or block because it's a battle. battle. Weird. So, it, it layers some very strange <laughs> stuff that isn't necessarily good. But, but it does make, mean that your Planeswalker can get swords. So, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it kind of makes Planeswalkers worse in a lot of ways. For but, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely does. Uh, okay. The coolest one is, like, uh, vehicles. Because you can play them uh, and they're immediately... And they get their abilities. Yeah, they get yeah, all their abilities. They don't have to be crude. Yeah. That's so, cool. Like a smuggler's copter becomes a 7-7 seven, seven flying draw discard. What happens with equipment? Because I know equipment, like creatures can't equip things or something. It turns them off. They cannot. They can now not equip the creature. So that kind of... If you have a lot of equipment, you don't want this card. Yeah. it, abs- it And they don't get any of the abilities. They are just 7-7 seven, seven artifact dinosaurs. Okay. Whew. Anyway, a lot of weird stuff going on with displaced dinosaurs, and it is absolutely hilarious. You can make dinosaur food tokens. You can make little dinosaur nuggets. I mean, the design on this card is really good. It's, it's great. So as cool. soon as you read it, you're like, wait, what? Yeah, how do I yeah. do that? What do I do with that? Yeah. And then in Commander, you're like, crap, I okay, spent seven mana and it doesn't do it doesn't anything. Do anything yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would just temper the expectations, and I definitely don't think it's worth $25 plus. Don't, don't pay that much money. Yeah, um, but still cool. I do like it. It's super funny. I like it a lot. All right. Uh, All right. We have a whole bunch more cards to talk about from Dr. Hugh, from Dr. Who here. Dr. Inclu- Hugh. Dr. Hugh, including a card <laughs> that we are comparing a little bit to Teferi's Protection. So you know that means it's pretty powerful. So uh, stay tuned if you want to hear about that. But we're going to take a quick break first and hear a message from our sponsors. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. A little pinch of salt and... Blech, ugh, oh God, that's horrible. I'm Agatha, and this vile cauldron was supposed to be chicken noodle soup, but it ended up poison. Again, thank goodness I have Factor, the service that delivers delicious chef-crafted meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. Look, I'm a little more suited to the coven than the oven, but Factor lets me dine like an evil queen. Each week, I can choose from over 34 different brews featuring options like Calorie Smart and Protein Plus to let me activate my wellness goal abilities. My sisters and I particularly love the Italian herb chicken. Whenever we order it, the whole team gets pumped. So spare yourselves the toil and trouble and sign up for Factor on the Double Double. <laughs> Head to Factormeals.com slash Command50 and use code Command50 to get 50% off. That's code Command50 at Factormeals.com slash Command50 to get 50% off. Late night at the command zone, Josh searches tirelessly for new employees. Ah. Okay, I gotta read resumes, check all the job sites. This is gonna take hours. I know, I'll find someone to do the hiring for me. Wait, but how do I hire them? This is indeed a conundrum. That's it, Indeed, the platform where I can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Their powerful hiring platform has tools that can help me find qualified candidates fast. I'll be shown resumes that meet my requirements immediately after I sponsor a post. Then, people I invite directly are three times more likely to apply than if they had just seen us in a search. Yes, I can finally join more than three million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent. I am a genius. (laughs) Josh okay? Oh yeah, he does this all the time. Hmm. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash command zone. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at indeed.com slash command zone. Just go to indeed.com slash command zone and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right, my new deck list is complete. Now, let's see which cards I don't already own and buy them. Wait. How'd you do that without going through a million boxes? 
Oh, I just use Architect. They make it super easy to upload and manage your collection. Then when you're done brewing a deck, you can sort it by collection status to see what you already have. So this group is just cards you don't own. Yep, I just click buy this stack and it takes me right to Card Kingdom. Whoa. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. We are going to get into what surprised me, but a lot of people in CDH were like, do we play this? And the answer is maybe. I don't know. I've heard I've heard a lot of mixed a lot of mixed. Uh, yeah, mixed this messages. is the one that's on being compared one. to Teferi's protection. Yeah, it's another protection card, and we're seeing you know we've seen quite a few of these recently, and it's starting to get to the point where yeah, the ups and downs. I, I, this is one of the things I love about Magic. Is yeah, you have to evaluate like the pluses and minuses. It's a little less mana. It does a little certainly uh, mm -hmm. diff slightly different things, but they're all comparable. And you're like, okay, but which one or two? You know, I'm not going to play twenty or play 20 protection spells. So yep. which of the, you know, two or three am I going to play? Does this fit in? Does it make it onto the list? Well, let's see. Let's find out. This one's called Everybody Lives. One in a white for an instant. All creatures gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. All creatures. Players gain hexproof until end of turn. Players can't lose life this turn. And players can't lose the game or win the game this turn. Players, all of them. Players. Nobody wins. Nobody loses. No creatures die. We just hold hands and sing just kumbaya. Just stop. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody be friends. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to have a conversation about like what this card actually does. Because there are like there there are a lot of cases where this is good. Yeah, um, it it stops alternate win cons. Anything just, that says some, so and so, you win the game. Yeah, approach of the second sun style good stuff. One. Because this is a, it's like a cast trigger, right? Like a counter spell doesn't beat the second approach. Correct. So if they cast approach of the second sun, you're like, nope, nobody wins. So it counters that. It counters like destroy based board wipes. The problem is it does it in the way you don't like though. Everybody it, keeps all. Everybody their stuff. keeps all. It's their not stuff. heroic intervention where you right. only just you keep yours. Yeah. Right. So you also can't use this proactively where you're like cast wrath of god with that on the hold, stack hold yeah. priority cast my heroic intervention. This right. Doesn't do that. So it stops them, but it doesn't exactly get you ahead on them, which right. most protection spells would. Now a lot of times you're being wiped if you want to save your board. It's because you are ahead. Right. So. Yeah. It's still good in a lot of those situations, but not, you know, maybe not as good, right? Yeah. It's not a game winning. It's, it's a counter spell sort of. It, it just can be. It's less, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, it targeted removal spells, of course. It gives all players, all creatures hexproof. So sword splashers will do it. Like, well, it'll counter that and it'll be like, okay, you're, you're having a Torwaki turn where you're pinging everybody's creatures. No, just stop. Stop it. No more of that. No more. Yeah. And I think people are hesitant to use cards like this to protect a single thing. But if you think about it, a negate will often protect a single thing, mm -hmm. cost the same amount of mana. So yeah, yeah it, this is, that is a real upside and you need to just be able in your brain to be okay being like, yes, this can protect a lot of things, but many times I will use it to protect one thing and that's mm -hmm. kind of a reason it exists, right? It is worth it. Yep. Uh, it stops targeted player interaction. Oh, interesting. So it stops Bajuka Bogs. Yeah, because that targets a player. A player. Yeah, okay. Uh, Settle the Wreckage also targets a player. Well, that's cool. So you can be like, ah, I, I it have... Because you Hexproof. Well, you everybody have hexproof. gives everybody. Yeah, but yeah. everybody's Hexproof, but that means there's no target for the Settle, settle the Wreckage. I've seen Settle the Wreckage deflecting swatted, which oh. is backbreaking. <laughs> like, you thought you were safe, man. <laughs> you were really not safe. Uh, it stops targeted mill, like Altar of Dimension like things that target obviously they'll probably do it on the stack on that's top of tough it. it's really tough for it to actually work against alter dimension because mm -hmm. the way they would have you know technically do it is like sack one thing yeah do you, you. and then you mill mm -hmm. and then sack another thing and then you mill so if you if they go sack one thing targeting you to mill and you go okay everybody lives and you're like they're like cool sack a thing now that's above on the stack mm -hmm. everybody lives and so if they mill you out you're not going to lose the game this turn you're going to lose the game next turn so this actually doesn't do much against mill because it only stops one turn yeah so if they mill you totally out you can go okay cool and on my upkeep cast this and i mm -hmm. get this turn which sometimes don't matter but with no cards in your library i hope your hand was big <laughs> the other interesting thing about this is it stops pay life effects oh so because it says life totals can't change I believe players can't lose life. Players can't lose life this turn. So that turns off like a Yogg Moth. You're not allowed to pay you life? You cannot pay life because that's not a cost you can do. Oh, interesting. It's like saying like you can't add mana to your mana pool or something. Yeah. 
It's like that's a little you bit crazy. And not pay the cost for like a, a Yawgmoth, which says pay so one like life, Kyrick sacrifice or a creature. Frexy mana, you either pay life or mana. So yeah, I think Kyrick's turned Here off. Here we go, new cards. It's like because because your life total cannot change, you cannot pay the cost of the Frexy of mana. pay life. The interesting thing is ad nauseum, ad nauseum, ad nauseum, yeah, ad nauseum, mm. mundum. <laughs> Ba-dum, ba-dum. Yeah, it's, we got it right in there somewhere. It says, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. You lose life equal to its converted mana cost. So this, you may repeat it as many as many times. Ad nauseum is not a pay life effect. It's a lose life effect that happens as a result. So you just can't lose the life? You just can't lose the life. So you can draw as many as you want? As many as you want with Ad nauseum. Okay, so this just became way better for CEDH then. I The interest, in, but like casting a spell that says your opponents can't win or lose... That's is true. Like, it's also you know, really I dangerous. Add Nas, and then I get what I need, and now I can't and win. And I can't win this turn. Oh, yep, yep. Okay, so it's that's like, cool. <laughs> it, it's like a good combo with Add Nas. Uh, they're both instants. You could do it on an end step and then untap and have all those cards. This feels, yeah, okay. That feels good and casual. Probably yeah. good in CH still. Yeah. But you have to have a lot more mana to start this process, too. So it's like, it does work how you want it to work with Add Nas. It does not work how you want it to work with like Yogmoth or Razaketh or something that says pay life colon. Interesting. Okay. What um, else does it? Does it that, this, I'm learning a lot here. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I've been learning a lot. Let me tell you in doing like this and the how to read a magic card oh, yeah. episode, yeah. I've been just like, wow, I'm a whole new magic player. <laughs> How to read a magic card. If you haven't seen that episode, I learned a lot just watching it. It's really cool. I was really happy. I thought I knew how to read magic cards after, yeah. you know, 10, 10 years of doing this. But <laughs> so those are all the things that it like, it says like stop actually does interact with those things. It doesn't stop damage from occurring. Yeah. This, it, which is interesting. Yeah. So if I swing with something and I would get an on combat damage effect, I still would get it. Right. Even though your life total won't change. The damage is still dealt. Right. Technically. But your life total can't change. So it's like, deal three. Cool. My life total can't change. But I, did I take three? Yes, I did. Yeah. So it's like damage Damage causes loss of life. So the loss of life part can't happen, but the damage still happens. So you'll still gain life from lifelink. You'll still get combat damage triggers like a professional facebreaker or a toski. Uh, commander damage will still happen. Yeah, yeah. I do remember this happening. You can't soon. lose to commander damage that That turn, turn but you just die on the you next turn. You just untap and then turn. Yeah, so that's that. interesting. If somebody hit you for 21 commander damage, yeah. you would lose zero life, but take 21 commander damage would be marked on you. And then, yeah, the turn would get passed and you would just immediately die. Yeah. So it's it's very strange. Like, <laughs> infect works the same way. Like, the damage is still dealt, so you still get the infect counters. You're not going to die now. Yeah. But if you have 10, you're just going to yeah. But But you're going to die to state-based actions. Okay. It obviously doesn't stop exile-based board wipes, farewells, and the like. Yep. Uh, it doesn't stop. It doesn't give anything other than creatures hexproof or indestructible. Uh-huh. So uh, you could still lose all of your artifacts or enchantments mm-hmm. to a bane of progress or something like that. Uh, so there is like this doesn't just stop everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's stuff that gets through and maybe that yeah. means that you can put this in a deck that cares more about that in between stuff, mm-hmm. more about commander damage or something like that. I mean, the more I think about it, the more this is absolutely playable in CDH, even though I don't know much about the format, so I'm yeah. to speak in ignorance. But at the same time, like, this is a card that stops somebody else's combo in. Yeah. And but allows you to live like, through it. Angel's Grace does a similar thing. Yeah. Angel's Grace says, like... And only you live. Yeah, and that's just you. Yeah. And Angel's Grace, like, sees some play. Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not a staple card. Angel's so, Grace is better than most people think. There are just yeah. a lot of situations where you're just like, I was going to die, and now I live, and now I... Yeah. You know, all those games where you're like, if I just had one more turn, guess what? It used to see a lot much more play than it did. I, th- I think it's just narrow now. Yeah. Like... If, if you can only cast it the turn that you're going to lose, then it's dead most of the game, uh, which doesn't feel super good. But, you know, if it wins you the game, it's a protection spell that doesn't give you advantage. And is that worth it? Like, you already have to have an advantage for this to give you an advantage. You know right. what I mean? Like, you already have to be ahead on board for this to be good. Well, that to me tells me there are certain decks that, com- in order to win, have to commit to the board. Mm. And then they get to a point where, like, I just have to maintain my board, and I will therefore win. And, you know, Heroic Intervention is a card played in a lot of decks like that because yeah. of this. Um so I would think, like, if I have to commit a lot of creatures to the board, I'm going to go wide or whatever it is, and I'm going to stick my neck out there uh 
then maybe I would think about running a card like this because yeah. sure, everybody gets to keep their board, but it's most important to me that I just maintain the current, you know, board state for everybody as it is mm-hmm. because I'm more likely to be ahead because my deck is built to get ahead like that. Right. Yeah. That, that makes sense. I mean, if you, if you know you're that kind of deck. Yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating card and I'm really curious to see it in play because I think it's going to, there's moments where it's going to be incredible and it's going to feel so good. And yep. there's definitely moments where you're like, man, it, if I cast this board wipe and I like sit, try and protect my board, I'm going to lose to this board that they untap with. And like, I just have to let all my stuff get wiped, which if you're holding open a protection spell, you really want to be able to use it to protect your board. Yeah. Uh, so it makes it feel a little bit more narrow, but it's also, it's also two mana and it can save your life. So it's, a, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, the big question for me is, you know, we compared it to Teferi's Protection, or we mm-hmm. said we were going to. Yeah. Heroic Intervention has been mentioned a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clever Concealment is a card that came out a little more recently that's seen quite a bit of play and kind of is a st- stand-in as a second to Teferi's Protection uh, very often. There's things like Boros Charm that give your whole board indestructible. Also has other modes. Where do you put it on the list with those other cards? I mean, Boros Charm, let's take it off just because yeah. it's in two color. It's a little bit harder to play. Yeah. Generally, if you're in Boros, you will play it, though, because it's it's more flexible. Yeah, and the double strike and the four damage actually do more than you think they will. Yeah, does it make it on the list with Teferi's Protection, Heroic Intervention, and Clever Concealment? Is there any argument to be made that it, you know, whatever the th- number three of those is, it sort of bumps it off if you have access to all of them? For me, I didn't put it, I didn't put it on this board. I really should have. Uh, Flawless Maneuver yep, that's is, another one. is like... Like, it's not better than Teferi's Protection or Clever Concealment for me because it, those say, like, I survive. Yeah. Like, my stuff survives. Yeah. And Clever Concealment Only. and and Clever Concealment can protect other things. Yeah. So, it can save your Smothering Tithe. It can save, like, other permanents that are important to you. Um, yeah, we should say everybody lives only all creatures. Creatures. Just gain creatures. Hexper in the circle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, the flexibility of being able to save other things matters for me in a lot of my decks. And flawless, man- I think if you're running flawless maneuver, this is that kind of deck. Like if your creatures are that important that you have one that just says creatures are indestructible for free, um, then I start looking at it. If you want the more flexible ones that are in a more balanced decks, I don't think it makes the cut there. But if you're playing a dedicated, aggressive deck, maybe even a life get link deck where you can still get that life link done and buy yourself just a full turn. Interesting. So you don't give a lot of weight to the um, players can't lose life and the players can't w- win or lose the game part of it. I mean, it's also a fog, I guess, in that sort of way. Yeah. Wh- whereas I don't know. You know I'm, I'm usually not the, that. Yeah, that's Teferi's true. Protection is it does Teferi's, so much. Yeah, Teferi's protection I think is in its own class and it's definitely really this is hard. Not better than that. No, and I don't think they should make a card that's better than Teferi's protection. It's too. Yeah, it's yeah. it's insane. Um, but this man, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard for me to weigh that part of it because I think... Because I don't you, play Angel's Grace. Do you play Angel's Grace? No, anything? but yeah. would I want it on a card that has other things? I think I would. The reason, like you said, yeah. I don't play Angel's Grace very often is because it's so narrow. Mm-hmm. This also saves a thing. But Angel's also. Grace doesn't make indestructible on all your creatures. It doesn't give you hexproof. It doesn't right. make so, you know... Mm-hmm. There's these other pieces of it which make it harder for me to weigh. I don't know the answer to the question I asked, by the yeah. way. So I'm going to cop out and just not answer it's, it. But. It's really tough. I mean, I... I think if you're playing Sunforger, you play this card for sure. Yeah, because, yeah, exactly. You can go find it when it yeah. is advantageous, of course. But it may, it's another card that I really want to have in hand and re- just feel like feel it out in different moments. I need to play some games and be like, does it save me here? Does it do what I want yeah, here? Yeah, so you get a good feel for, in general, yeah. am I like, oh, sweet? Or am I like, this card's doing nothing? Like, right. ha- what's my average feeling about it in yeah. games? Yeah. Could go either way. Uh, yeah. All right. Very cool. Very cool card. All right, the uh, next one is also a mono white card. It is Everything Comes to Dust. Seven white, white, white. Keep reading. <laughs> Ten mana <laughs> for a sorcery. Don't worry, has convoked. Yeah, it's nothing. Except This is interesting. It says, exile all creatures except those that share a creature type with a creature that convoked this spell, all artifacts, and all enchantments. So artifacts and enchantments are going away. They're gone. But if a creature sells, shares a creature with creature type with a creature that convoked this spell, it will live. All of including them. Including your opponents. Yes. It, so if you convoke with a human and your opponent has a human, their human will not be exiled either. Right. So. This card is fascinating to me. Yeah, you have. 
some little bit of control, maybe a lot control, over making you know a, a, a one sided wipe in some ways. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can get unlucky where like, well, I'd really like to save my dragon, but Jimmy also has a dragon and his is better, so I'm gonna yeah, not I'm gonna let my dragon the, go. Yeah, or it could be situations where like I have to because in order I need to the mana cast this, I need to tap that creature, and it's just unfortunate. But you're gonna keep that. Yeah, it's um. So the the more I thought about it, the more I think this is a typal card. This is like in a dedicated creature type that isn't human. This card's great. Like in an angel deck, if you can if you can tap out, if you can get play pay seven, you tap like three of your smaller angels. Yeah. You exile basically everything else. You keep your whole board, and you have a bunch of untapped angels that can now attack on a clear board. It does get rid of all artifacts and enchantments. So I yes. think your deck has to be. Yeah, a creature type, but also not very reliant on, right. you know, artifacts and enchantments. Because I think that's the downside. Otherwise, you compare it to, like, Crux of Fate or something like that. Right. So, if you've got a certain, you know, car- creature type, mm-hmm. and it's not humans, yeah. And we say not humans because humans are so, They're so common. common. They, Elves are, like, yeah, so common. Very likely that you're not able to war- to wipe some important creatures from your opponent's boards. Mm. But if you are, you know, merfolk or... There are Bant Murfolk decks. There are. Um, Prof is just begging for a Bant Murfolk legendary someday. Maybe I'll get in line. I would love it. Um, Yeah. If you're in some angels is a good one because very narrow, even like demons, something like that. Even, yeah. I guess demons won't necessarily be in Knights will get most things. Yeah. It depends on, you may have a lot of human knights is is part of it. True. I think you're less likely to have, I think knights is narrow enough that, you know, maybe a creature lives. The knight tokens that don't usually have have other creature types. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do humans. I wouldn't want to do soldiers. Yeah. And, but if it gets most of the board and this is mostly an exile one-sided board wipe, this is extremely powerful. Yeah. In Garrick's Wake, is what I would look at as a comp, which mm. is nine mana, yeah, and wipes, you know, everybody's board but yours. Um, yeah, seems pretty powerful. Uh, the down, I think that artifacts and enchantments does hurt it though, because it does. Very often you're like, I, I, but I need to keep this enchantment, or I need to keep this artifact, and I'm not as a head on board without those things. Right. Yeah. It's very interesting because if I'm playing white, white, white. Like, if I'm playing cards that have three white pips, I am leaning on my artifacts usually pretty heavily. And I'll have a lot of creatures um, in in those kind of decks. But, it, yeah, you're definitely going to, like, I'm going to lose my Mask of Memory. I'm going to lose a Ghostly Prison or something like that. But if I keep my whole board and I'm an aggressive deck, this becomes, you know, not an instant speed Cyclonic Rift, but this, be- like, clears the way for you to be able to attack and get a huge turn of advantage because normally i look at this kind of wipe that just is like get rid of everything yeah and i hate it because it just has reset the game yeah like farewell says like we're gonna exile everything the game is at zero yeah so i as a result i don't run a lot of farewell because i just i would rather somebody win right let's just start <laughs> over yeah exactly uh but because this is an exile wipe that deals with your opponent's stuff, it gives you that advantage to close out the game. I did want to say it's... Ideally. I did want to say it's possible this is good in Super Friends decks because notably it does not exile all Planeswalkers. Doesn't, yep. Yeah, so, and a lot of Planeswalkers do make tokens which you could use to convoke this out mm-hmm. uh, so it won't cost 10 mana and that is a situation where very often you're perfectly fine. I'll keep my two or three walkers, wipe everything else off the board mm-hmm. and I'll just sit here be- between the advantage I'm going to get now as you redeploy from my three walkers and, you know, Obviously, if you have more than three walkers, you're going to win it anyway. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea anyway. Yeah. But if you play an Elspeth or whatever and you're like, cool, make three soldiers. Mm-hmm. Now convoke this thing out. You know, if there's not a lot of soldiers, other soldiers out there, you're just like, yep, okay, go. But it is very weird. You're going to have to be like, what creature types does everyone have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody's in white and they ask that question, <laughs> uh, I might not stick my neck out too far on the it's board there. That yeah. or the super scary or the overrun that's like, all goblins get plus two and all <laughs> warriors get plus five. Uh, okay. Everything comes to dust. Super interesting. I think the more I think about it, the more this wants to go in a dedicated creature type deck so you don't convoke your whole board and you get that big attack because I think the attack is is the advantage that you want there. Uh, at least for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Convoke one of them. Yeah. And 
you know, pay nine and then pay, just, yeah. just kill everybody now because you don't have any blockers. Yeah. Uh, this next card is, oh gosh, well, I mean, one of the most powerful cards in the set for sure. It is Flesh Duplicate. It duplicates flesh. Yuck. It is a blue, 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 blue shapeshifter rebel. It is a zero, zero. You may have flesh duplicate. Enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it as vanishing three. If that creature doesn't have vanishing, uh, a permanent with vanishing three enters the battlefield with three time counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, remove a time counter from it. When the last is removed, sacrifice it. So you play this as a clone, you go to your upkeep, you remove one down to two, next upkeep, you remove two down to one, next upkeep, you remove one, it sacrifices. Yeah, you get it for three turns. Three turns. Yeah. Two mana clone. I mean, that's great. Two mana clones are super powerful. Phantasmal image is, I have it in a lot of decks. You don't need a lot of synergy to play that because you are almost always getting the advantage of just, I'm copying something that costs six or five mana. And I pay two mana. And that is an insane thing. Yeah. Like, that is just a way to make almost any card broken, right? Like, just imagine any five CMC thing that exists. Okay, now it's two CMC. Yeah. Yeah. Even just vanilla creatures kind of start to feel broken at that point. So Absolutely. Yeah. So, this is subtly different because it's like Phantasmal Image has that illusion downside. Right. So, if it becomes targeted, it gets sacrificed. And this has that vanishing downside. Right. Three turns is a long time in Commander. Yeah, it's a long time. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how to square those two things. Yeah. They, they both are legitimate downsides. They're not like they never come up. Um, Phantasmal Image, I, I find that it's fairly rare that they uh, like have a, a ability on board that would mm-hmm. do it. And fairly rare that whatever they were targeted it with is not a removal spell anyway. Right. You know, every once in a while you get like an untapper and you're That's like, terrible, crap, yeah. I can't play this. Yeah. But that in that case, you usually just don't play that. Yeah. Yeah. I so I think Phantasmal Image is better than Flesh Duplicate for those reasons. I think because it's one in, it's one in a blue uh, makes a big difference. Like we said, blue oh, blue, is, really blue, blue is a big cost. Yep. Um, and the targeted thing is is more difficult. I think this is closer to a Dance of Many, mm-hmm. which is blue blue for an enchantment that ETBs makes a token copy of something. But the enchantment itself has a has an upkeep. You have to pay blue blue on your upkeep every turn. And when the enchantment goes, the token goes. So it it has the same cost. It has that that sort of clock where you're like, maybe I'll pay blue to keep it, but it, I've probably gotten my value out of it. Right. Um, obviously, it doesn't do the token things that dance of many can you can populate and and all of that. But um, I should say, and you've got it down here. Um, Imposter mech is also worth discussing just because mm-hmm. it has an interesting upside that's or downside that sometimes is an upside. Yep. Where it copies a creature, but it turns it into a vehicle. Mm-hmm. And so that means it's not always a creature it makes it harder to remove. I've found that to be pretty close to phantasmal image. Yeah, I mean, it gives it hay sometimes if they have a tap ability and yeah. you get to put it on your imposter mech. The biggest difference with imposter mech is it can only target your opponent's creatures. Yeah, that, so. that which is a pretty big downside, right? Because right? you can build your deck, you can't build your opponent's decks. Right. So I think flesh duplicate is better than imposter mech for that reason. Probably. Because you always, like, you can copy something from your board with yep. it. But I love imposter mech. I also use the crew as an upside a lot of the time if I need to tap stuff. So, you know, there's synergy in both ways. Uh, another thing we were talking about here in the office mm. that Flesh Duplicate can do that Phantasmal Image can't is be blinked. Yes. So you can't target the Phantasmal Image. So there's all kinds of creatures. And a, a lot of times you want to copy a creature with an Enter the Battlefield effect so you get some value now, mm-hmm. especially if it's got Vanishing or the Illusion Clause. And the ability to blink that creature is pretty good, especially since it'll yeah. come back in and can copy something else. Yeah. So if you have blink effects in your deck, you can't play Phantasmal Image really. You probably still can, but you're not going to get full value. Flesh Duplicate is almost better because it resets the vanishing as well. Yeah. I mean, that's great. Like, if it ETB, you hit a Sun Titan, reanimate a thing, and then, like... Reanimate your Phantasmal image. Yeah. And then, <laughs> get a Phantasmal image. <laughs> Copy the Sun Titan. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, but then you blink the f- Flesh Duplicate, and you're like, actually, uh, on, like, on your end step, I'm going to blink the Flesh Duplicate, and I'm going to make it an Itali. Yeah. And now I untap, and I can attack with it. Um, yeah, Phantasmal Image cannot do that. No, uh, it's very difficult to reset. So in Blink Dex, fl- Flesh Duplicate g- g- is better immediately for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And clones are really powerful with Blink. It's uh, I, I still play Phantasmal Image even in like my Rune deck. Yeah. Uh, even though I cannot Blink it, just two mana to copy whatever ETB mm-hmm. I've got is very powerful. Yeah. And, uh, and just very often worth it, yeah. 
I don't know. I think this is close, and it's probably close enough that some decks, like Blink decks, this will you know be what you put in, and mm-hmm. some decks you'll still go with Phantasmal Image. So, and some decks, you know, Imposter Mech is the right choice as well. So, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, it's cool I how they like find it. all these little, little differences, little just knots. enough to yeah. And some decks will just be like, cool, I'm going to run all three of those things, or all four with the Dance of Many, because that's what my deck's doing. Yep. The two mana is so good. It's broken. I mean, it really, like I said, Phantasmal Image really could just be a staple card and kind of is for how good it is. Yeah. You I mean, can it, always it, find a way that, like, these are two mana well spent. Yeah. If you're at a 90, if you're at like 99 cards in your deck and you're just like, ah, I need a card, uh, like, it's very easy to just be like, throw a Phantasmal Image in, yeah. throw a Flash Duplicate in. It'll almost like, never make your deck worse. And it's probably almost always going to be better than the other card you're considering for that slot. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know a lot of people don't like. I'm always at 114 cards and <laughs> trying to go down. That's so true. I don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah. Whoever you are, that person out there that's yeah, at 99 no. cards that can't figure out the last one. How? Like, yeah. How do you do you. that? I want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one is I haven't been throwing these. Sorry. I'll just make up for last time. Oh, that's two. <laughs> All right. Sorry. The next one is a fuse card. It's Gallifrey Falls No More. So it is uh, an old style fuse card. It has two cards sideways. Gallifrey Falls is four red, red for an instant. It deals four damage to each creature. If a creature dealt damage this way would die this turn, exile it instead. And then the other side is no more, which is two and a white for an instant. Any number of target creatures you control phase out. And of course it has fuse. You may cast one or both halves of this card from your hand. So the synergy here is obvious. You can cast uh, the fuse. And the way that this is worded or structured, the... Gallifrey Falls will go on the stack, and then the No More will go on the stack. So the No More will f- resolve. Your f- creatures will phase out, and then, boom, you deal four to everything, saving your own creatures. Yeah. So this is either a six-mana instant speed, deal four damage to all creatures, a three-mana phase out your board. Any number, so it doesn't have to be all. six red, red, white, instant speed, four damage to all creatures, but not your creatures. Right. Uh, <laughs> a lot to think about. Let's talk about these as individual cards first. Sure. Uh, so let's talk about Gallifrey Falls, because this is a six mana instant speed board wipe that deals four damage to each creature, which right. is going to kill a lot for damage. Yeah. Often not everything. Often not everything. And, and not the big stuff, which is often the scariest. Right. I guess you could do this in response to a Crater Hoof trigger. Sure. And sure. like kill a lot six of their stuff. you up, it is an instant. It is. Yeah. The instant speed thing is really interesting because it's like, we don't typically play Storm's Wrath, which is uh, just deal four damage to each creature and each player for four mana at sorcery speed. Uh-huh. Like, that's not really the red board we reach for. Um, and... I think we do play Mizium Mortars. At least I play Mizium Mortars, little, which is yeah. three red, 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 deal four damage to all the creatures you don't control. So it's one-sided. Right. Six mana, three red. Yeah. But sort of does the combination of these two things. Sort of, not the exact same. S- yeah, sort of. At sorcery speed. Yeah. Which is a little different. Well, I think that's quite a bit worse, obviously. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the three red versus the two red is yeah. a huge uh, is a huge difference. So... Where does this lie? It's six mana, it's instant speed, but it hits everything. Like, would you play Gallifrey Falls if that was the only card? No, and I don't think most people probably yeah. would. It, it Mizium Mortars also has the mode of just deal four damage to something. Yeah, it can just kill for something. Two, for two, which for you often do red. use. Yeah. Uh, just, I just want to kill that. I'm not going to wait to have six mana. Right, yeah. Yeah. Gallifrey Falls has different flexibility, which I think is what makes it interesting because No More right. as just a card is almost more playable than Gallifrey Falls is. I agree. So No More is two and white for any number of target creatures you control phase out, which is very close to Clever Concealment, mm-hmm. does an approximation of Teferi's Protection, does an approximation of a lot of what we talk about for like Heroic Intervention, uh, Everybody Lives. Mm-hmm. You know, it's doing what we, uh, Flawless Maneuver, yep. what we consider to be sort of the more important part of a lot of these cards or the more, you know, commonly useful. So if I was going to play only one of these cards, I would consider No More as a card that I would play. Um, So you look at Gallifrey Falls as the gravy part of it. Right. And once you do that, it's kind of close. It's close. It's three mana. (laughs) And it's it's three mana. Flawless Maneuver is three mana or free. Yeah. Like Clever Concealment is four mana or free or one mana or two mana. 
Teferi's protection is always three, but obviously does way more. Um, so this is closer to like a guardian of faith, which, which is the creature with flash that faces at your whole point. Yes, yes. Which I don't run a lot of. Right. I, li- the f- I like the free ones. <laughs> Turns out they're, th- they're easier to hold up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's <just> true. <laughs> but, you know, we hold open two for heroic intervention, but that's in green. Right. So uh, it's tough. Holding three, o- three mana open in a white deck is a lot. Yeah. And how open? How often are you ever going to hold nine mana open? Like, Oh, man. I mean, that means I have to have a board. I have to have... It feels almost impossible yeah. to really do that. So maybe you would always just do that at sorcery speed anyway, just to get rid of blockers to attack. Yeah, I could see that. But that sucks. Actually, you can't even do that. Your creatures phase out. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't You can't, You can't. can't one-sided board, board wipe and then, and then attack. And then yeah. attack. Yeah. You can one-sided board wipe on the end step before your turn. But yeah. then you have to hold nine mana open and hope nothing that happens on the three Affects turns your make your plan, you know, untenable. That feels yeah. like not a realistic thing you would basically ever want to do unless you find yourself in a deck that has a lot of instants. Right. And you're fine to just play on other people's turns for the most part. Yeah. I think probably... It's also worse with Sunforger because you can't tutor it up. Yeah. Which you can tutor all of the all of this except for Guardian of Faith. Yeah. I think probably all this is adding up to like... It's, I just won't play this card. Yeah. It doesn't beat Boros Charm for me. It just, yeah. does, like, it just yeah. doesn't get there. Uh, and that's the difference between two mana and nine mana or even three mana. Yeah. Because no more is, is close, but not, I don't think, playable on its own. Mm-hmm. And you just can't come up with realistic scenarios where you want the other, the, even though it's just gravy kind of. Yeah. You'd have to have an empty board or like all of your stuff is bigger than four damage. Like, in, or you have protection from, if you have like a, the guy that says your creatures don't take non-combat damage, I guess. But then you have, you're already doing something else. Like, just, do we it's play not like, him? Yeah, it's you. <laughs> realistic scenarios yeah. are hard to come up with. Yeah. yeah. So if they're if that's the case, then just play flawless maneuver and be happy because it costs zero. Yeah, I think if you if you have upside from the board wipe for some reason, you want to deal damage to creatures. Like if you're running something repercussion like, like stuffy or, dolls or, yeah. and repercussions that kind of sure. thing, then this has additional upside. But just on its face as a protection spell, I'd run Boros Charm first. I'd run flawless maneuver first. I'd Very run Teferi's protection, Kinsey Clever Concealment yeah. first. Um, and you don't I'd want probably run Everybody Lives first interesting i think i think i would too yeah i think th- i think i'd run everybody protects you from more first. stuff yeah yeah then then gallifrey falls and no more um yeah that's that's where i'm at okay so expensive oh this next one's sweet it's, you like the black sagas yeah i do <laughs> it's genesis of the daleks for black black the first three chapters say Create a 3-3 black Dalek artifact creature token with menace for each lore counter on Genesis of the Daleks. So first chapter make one, second chapter make two, third chapter make three, six total. Yep. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, fourth chapter says target opponent faces a villainous choice. Destroy all Dalek creatures and each of your opponents loses life equal to the total power of Daleks that died this turn or destroy all non-Dalek creatures. So this says either kill the six Daleks that were just made and everybody takes 18 or destroy everything but the Daleks. And remember, this will happen on your first main phase. So that means they are going to town. Yeah. I mean, that's what it says under the best case scenario. Yeah. I, I think it's probably optimistic to think that all those six Daleks are still Survive, there. Survive, yeah. Yeah, because sure. it's three turns. Creatures yeah. die. In mm-hmm. a lot of cases, they might just board wipe you after chapter three right. and be like, cool, chapter four resolves. There's no Daleks. We don't, do we don't care. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the question you got to ask is, is six mana make six Daleks at, over three over turns? Over three turns. Good. That's, that's the thing is... Um, well, I, I suppose I should say, if you have other Daleks, it will count those for oh, yeah. chapter four as well. If you right? have other changelings. Yeah. If you have big changelings. Yeah. So that part of it maybe changes the calculus if you can have a lot of Daleks and say, oh, I'm not going to have six. I'm going to have 20 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, maybe that makes it a little different. I'm but a mirror entity. I can make my whole board seven, like 49, 49s right. or whatever. Yeah. But that's a very specific deck. I think most decks would be playing this and being like, I do want tokens. Mm-hmm. This makes a lot of them. It has a little of a weird thing at the end that maybe is an upside or whatever. Um, yeah. That's the question I would say is like, is six Daleks over three turns worth six mana? It's uh, probably not unless you have synergy around artifact creatures or you have synergy around Daleks. If you have like synergy around tokens, 
uh, you can make it worth that. The tricky part about this is, is you're like, you read it and you're like, whoa, that's so powerful. And you're like, this is, this happens four turns after a it's six mana so saga. Long. It's wildly slow. Um, cause you pay six mana, you make a three, three this turn. Yep. Like if you cast that on turn six, you're just like, <sighs> <laughs> like I guess I'll get this clock started but it doesn't do anything right now so this you really want to power out with like black it, the ritual ramp right you like you want this on early. turn four yeah dark ritual would be sweet yeah dark ritual this is terrifying because now it's one but next turn it's two and in the game nights you had Dal- like the Dalek tokens the three threes with menace yep they are nasty yeah the menace is a real pain in the butt they're really tough yeah so it's like one of them is a problem but like it's the it's the spiraling that makes this this uh really bad. I mean I, I think also evaluating chapter four as a board wipe that you might be able to talk somebody else into mm-hmm. uh or maybe just like get the arch enemy under control. Right. As well. Because remember, you're gonna choose or it's target opponent faces. Target opponent. Focus. So you get to pick somebody. Yeah, so you can talk to everybody and be like you know, we need to wipe the non-Daleks because of this person and then right. I will hit them with the Daleks and that will maybe be the end of it. And yeah. you can often find a Jimmy who's willing to make that uh, yeah. deal with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so that that is a little bit of an upside with, you know, politics and whatnot. Uh, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, they're like, well, we'll just kill all the Daleks you made and we'll take six, maybe yeah. three. We saw this coming, so we've yeah. prepared for it in some way. We've killed some off. We've whatever yeah. we've done. Yeah. It's uh what I like about it is it does something on its own. Yeah. Like true. this is this it's is a whole up. plan where if you cast this you need no other cards to be like a threat. Right. And they have to like that they have to do something about. Yeah, and when you're on chapter 2, you've got all your mana open. Right. You're you're doing plan B while they're still dealing with plan A. Right. So like you're just generating value that is a scary clock that your opponents do have to do something about yeah whether it's kill you whether it's kill the daleks whether it's remove the enchantment your opponents have to do something because if it just goes off ah it's bad it's really bad so what i like i like it in a deck that wants to that wants to operate on as few cards as possible like if you're playing a control deck where a lot of stuff is is guaranteed to like or uh, a lot of your cards are dedicated to controlling the board um, this is something that you can just put down and probably hold up a removal spell or probably hold up other spells and it does its work without you having to commit a bunch to the board. I'd also say it's probably good in decks that can control the counters a little bit, but it sure. doesn't look like it can. Yeah. Uh, so you can sort of secretly be like, oh, you thought it was going to go to four. It's actually not. It's going to go yeah, back to, go. yeah, exactly. And that screws up there because they're going to, as soon as you play this card, they're going to come up with a plan in their head of like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to kill a couple of dogs or uh, once it gets to this point, I'm going to destroy it mm. or whatever it is. They're going to start to like consider it and then they're going to make their plays with that plan in mind. Like that means this turn I'm safe to do this because it's next turn when I'm going to mm. deal with that. And when you can change the chapters on it, you win a lot of games by them being like, oh crap, my plan was this, but you changed your plan and now my plan doesn't work and I die. Yeah. So. It's uh, you get you have to be a little bit tricksy with it, or you have to be in a deck that wants p- your opponents to be like, look over here. Yeah, <laughs> look over here. <laughs> it's true. A lot of times you're like, I'm just gonna play this card, so they deal with. They yeah, take some time dealing with that, and I'm while doing I do my other actual things. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Impending flux. This is a three mana sorcery. It has paradox. Impending flux deals X damage to each opponent and each creature they control, where X is one plus the number of cards you've cast from anywhere other than your hand this turn. It also has foretell one red red. So naturally, it deals uh, like we just cast this as a three mana sorcery. It deals one damage to each each uh, opponent each and each creature. It's well below rate. Well, yeah, not what you want. If you cast this from foretell, like you foretell it on two, you cast it for three. It deals two damage to each creature and opponent. Also, pretty below rate. Yeah, you paid five for that. So you really need to put work into making this card a full board wipe. You have to. Uh... Yeah, you have to 
cast a whole bunch more spells before you knock it off foretell yeah and this is like the obvious comparison is delayed blast fireball which is an incredible card this, this is three mana like it, yeah. cast from instant speed deals five if, if you cast it from exile i think it specifies yeah so you yeah usually impulse draw into it and then impulse blow draw. everybody out of the water yeah, and it's got foretell and you have to i've cast lost a lot of games just they just happen to hit a delayed blast, just blast cascade fireball into delayed blast fireball and you're, and you're like, like oh, what well that's the ball game yeah <laughs> There's a one-sided board wipe that deals 15 damage. Thank you. So this is not that. Uh, but Why does it cost three? Sorry, we're not talking about Delayed Blast Fireball. Yeah. Uh, that, it costs I, six, Josh. Huh? Yeah. It never, I've never seen anybody pay six for it. It's so stupid. Okay, back to Impending Flux. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, th- this is is obviously not, not as powerful as Delayed Blast Fireball. It goes in those kind of decks that wants to cast like a number of spells from Exile. Um, but I wanted to talk about it because of like cascade. Yeah. So if you're, if you're playing a cascade deck where you're just like, I'm going to ca- cast this and it has cascade, I'm going to cast this, which also has cascade. Now I'm incidentally casting spells from exile and this is only three mana. So now you can do three, four, like, and it's just because you're progressing your, your game plan. Yeah. I mean, my problem with that is you're likely to hit it and deal two to everything. Yeah. Which is fine. But I sort of think maybe it's like Prosper or something else that you want where you can Suddenly at least control card. it. Yeah, exactly. We're like, cool, okay. I'm going to foretell this or if I hit it off an impulse draw, I have other impulse draw in my deck and mm-hmm. I'm going to be able to take advantage of like, okay. Because you really want this hit for like, I'd say probably at least three, but four would probably be the best. Four's ideal. I yeah. think three, you're like, good enough. It'll probably be okay. Yeah. But at four, it'll probably take out almost everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of your opponents only. Remember, this is opponents. So that that... I think gives you more control because yeah, just cascading into it for for, for like two for two is two, less two, likely right. to be that devastating. I yeah I I actually had this slated for another card, but we should we could talk about it here. Like four damage takes out is is sort of where uh, is enough damage to take out most of the top commanders and most of the top uh, played creatures in commander. Um, so... Oh, we did math. Sweet, I like math. I did math. So four damage will take out a lot of creatures, and it will take out 65% of the top 100 commanders on EDA track. Will be reliably killed with four damage. Obviously, if they're modified in any way, then not. Uh, So only 35 of the top 100 cannot be. They're bigger than that, or they're just likely... It can't it, can't yep. be dealt damage by, uh, and of the non commanders, sixty two percent of the top one hundred cards on H rec can be reliably killed with four damage. Fifteen percent of the top one hundred creatures on EDH rec cannot; they're too big. Twenty three percent of the top one hundred creatures on EDH rec are reliably not worth removing. So ETB creatures, Sukur, Tri Builder, etc. But they can be killed by this. It will get them off the board, but right. it, you just didn't give value, maybe. Yeah. So, it, but this says eighty-five percent of the top like one hundred played creatures on EDA Trek will be killed by four. But four is not the easiest. You got to cast three other spells than this. Yeah. Well, if you cast this from Exile, then then it counts as an extra one. Oh, it counts itself. It counts itself. Oh, so, so two cards plus this It's like two this and then exile? this from Exile. Oh, okay, that's more It's a little bit closer. Yeah, for sure. So, so you foretell this. Yeah. And then you just... Okay, so you can cast two other spells plus a three drop. I mean, they'd have to... You have to cast those from Exile. Yeah. They have to be kind of small. Yep. It is a Still high synergy card and it is tough to make work. But the fact that it is at least not symmetrical, so if it fires off for three, it is fine and will take out like meaningful things. And... uh it, it, you know, it synergizes with your plan. So if you're playing a Prosper Tonebound deck, if you're playing Rocco Street Chef, where your deck is designed to cast as many things from Exile as you possibly can. My The problem here is that you really want to control a lot of uh, variables in, in Storm. Mm. And Impulse Draw naturally works against that because it lowers the amount of time. It, that's the difference between it being in your hand and it be, being Impulse mm. Draw is it... it it really is stringent on the the time period you have available to cast that card. Right. And so you flip this off of Prosper. And you're like, oh, I guess I'm storming now. (laughs) And that it's, yeah. And it's like, that can often be not when you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I like to not have very many cards in my deck with impulse draw that are like counter spells and things like that. Right. Because those are just less useful. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I want more cards that are like, this is kind of going to be fine or good, fine to good in every situation that I might Mm -hmm. hit it. And, 
this one was a little bit harder. So Delay Blast Fireball works because it is always good. You hit it, as long as you've got three mana, you just cast it. And it's great. It's devastating. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's crazy devastating, especially early in the game. But there's not a situation where you flip it and you're like, this is not going to do much. But yeah. impending flux, there are many situations where it's yeah. like that. So, it's only going to do one to each thing. And yeah. Like, well, I guess I cleaned up a couple of like mana dorks, but not really worth three mana. Yeah. So that would be my hesitancy with the card. I think it's probably not something I'm looking to run unless I have an impulse draw deck that's real low to the ground, has a lot of one drop cycling yeah. cantrippy stuff. Yeah. I think Obnixilis, Captive Kingpin, where you're exiling a ton of stuff is like is how the deck works. And you're going to cast a bunch of cheap things. This is going to be really good. And there are decks where this is great. Like Commander Lear Porter, I think is this is cracked. Have you seen this card? Whenever you attack, spells you cast from exile this turn cost X less to cast where X is the number of players being attacked. Exile the top X cards of your library until end of turn. You may cast spells from among those exiled cards. So if you attack three, three players, you exile three cards, they all cost three less. Wow. And all of the spells that you have in exile cost three less. I feel like I should have seen this card, but I don't look at the Boros Nobody cards. plays this because it's <laughs> I've never uncommon. Seen it. I've never it seen Boros. it. It is cracked. <laughs> I saw a deck that was just the whole thing was three mana artifacts. The whole deck. And, and you're just like, cast this for free, cast this for free, cast this for free. It's incredible. It's very cool. This card's awesome. Impending Flux goes in that kind of deck. There are homes for this card, but it is a lot finickier, finickier than the cards that we have seen before that are similar. All right, the next card is Nanogene Conversion. Yeah. Three and a blue for a sorcery. Choose target creature you control. Each other creature becomes a copy of that creature until end of turn, except it isn't legendary. Each other creature. That's your opponent's too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a weird it's, one. Uh, it's a weird one. It's very similar to like an Echoing Equation or a Sakashima's Will, which are both effects that exist. Uh, Echoing Equation is five mana, and I think it only changes your creatures. Yeah, each each creature you control. So it's five mana. It just changes your creatures. Uh, and it's a Simic card because it's on the back of Augmenter Pugilist. And Sakashima's Will doesn't help you get around the legendary rule. Ah. So Nanogene Conversion turns every creature <laughs> probably into your commander. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> it, which is wild. Now what? I mean, you... <laughs> <laughs> the funniest thing I can think of is Volo. Is oh Volo God. Guide to Monster. You turn, you turn all of your creatures into Volo. Now you cast a, a creature spell. If it isn't a human or a you wizard, get you get like five copies of it. So you want things that are only going to happen during your turn. Right. Like casting creature spells. Okay, like, uh, that yeah. makes sense. Uh, or just stuff that only you can take advantage of. Like if their whole board, I guess, can you, can you, what if you copy like a, like a zero? What if you copy a walking ballista with this? Uh, everything dies? Everything dies? I think so. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That is cool. I mean, your walking ballista would still be around, I guess. Yeah, your walking ballista survives. If you're like a plus one counter deck or if you're like, you have a bunch of base zero stuff, I have a germ. So this becomes sort of a... Oh, a germ. Totally. I have a germ. <laughs> Everything's germs. <laughs> Brr, uh, bye. <laughs> That's cool. Neat. Uh, Everyone said Brutoclad online. Yeah. Which so, is uh, creature tokens you control have haste, and then the beginning of combat on your turn create a 2 1 blue mirror uh, creature token, and you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. So what you can do is. Everything's Brutoclads. Yeah, basically. As long as you add a token when you cast this card, right. one of the tokens would have turned into a Brutoclad, and then. Yes. You'll make the two ones and then turn all your all tokens into, into Brutoclads as well, which are four fours. Yeah. Yeah. And then attack. That's pretty sweet. I guess so. Yeah, it's a... Uh, you I really, thought Orvar might be cool. Orvar's gross. Because <laughs> so, you make a lot of tokens in the Orvar deck, yeah, too. Yeah, you make a ton of tokens. You turn all your creatures into Orvar. You don't often have a ton of creatures, but even having only like three Orvars... I often have a lot of those um, get whatever instant or sorcery back from your graveyard. Yeah, like Archaeomancer and that kind of thing. So it's like Archaeomancer, cast this, get that mm, back, make an Archaeomancer. And I'm like, I've got five Archaeomancers, but they're not going to kill you. In it. But right. if you went, okay, now I have six Orvars... <laughs> cast one thing targeting you know yeah. one of the orvars like makes six, six more ovars uh -huh. that are non-legendary i feel like we're getting just there? attack with orvars yeah. at a certain point <laughs> three like, threes I don't attack know. yeah yeah i magnus the red was one that i saw is, is like is super good it's instance of sorceries you cast cost one less to cast for each creature token you control uh -oh. so this tends to go super super wide yep. and then whenever it deals combat damage to a player you make a spawn it itself is a four or five with flying, by the way. So you turn all your tokens into Magnuses. And now all of your spells cost 
so much less. You know, yeah, just like like, 10 less. like way more than that. I mean, if you have like five creatures and they're all Magnuses, you have three tokens. They all cost yeah fifteen less. That's very reasonable. Whew. Yeah. Uh, and then they all hit and you make three, three spawns off of each of them. I mean, then you probably just are like Comet Storm. Win. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have all these tokens. Now everything costs like one bajillion less. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. It makes Pretty it sweet. kind of Mizzix-esque. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Uh, Lord of the Nazgul is a clone deck. It says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery uh, spell, you make a three, three black wraith creature token with menace. Then if you control nine or more wraiths, wraiths you, you control at base power and toughness nine, nine until end of turn. Uh, so you cast some sense of sorceries, you make all these wraiths. You even turn, on cast of this, you'd make a wraith. Yeah. You turn all of them in the Lord into of Lord of the Nazgul's <laughs> and now you have a ton of wraiths. So they're nine, nines they're nine, nine, nine. And, and, oh, and flying. Sweet. Okay. So there's, it's definitely win cons. It's, it's such a curious, but they all have flying blockers because all of their stuff are also your flyers, oh, right? Because right? they have all Lord of Nazgul yeah. too. So they're like, okay, at least they can so live. You, so yours are nine nines and you best hope they don't have nine of them. Because <laughs> <laughs> then they also have nine nines. feels like it's not a great combat win con. It has to be like a value based play. You want to be going wide because if they're going wide. Yeah, you have to be super wide. Yeah, you want to be going wide because if they're also going wide, you could help them more than you help yourself if you're yeah. not careful. Yeah. I mean, there's a late game play combined with something else. Yeah. It only costs four, so it's not hard to combine this with like two other spells or a five drop or something in a lot of these scenarios. Turn everything into perforos. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then just cast like a raise the alarm and yeah. be like, yeah. And be like, Prrr. yeah, everybody takes 24. Yeah, as long as he's a creature. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, that's true. You have to devote him. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a cool card. I think there's just going to be a lot of scenarios where people cast that and you're like, oh, what the heck ha even happens? Yeah, for sure. You have to be super careful because uh, it, it gets messy. Sonic Screwdriver is the next card and this card does it all. It's a three mana artifact that taps for one mana of any color. It also says one tap, untap another target artifact, two tap scry, three tap target creature can't be blocked this turn. Now remember you are tapping a mana rock to do this. So it is like all of those are sort of one more. Yeah. It's like two mana to untap target artifact, three mana to scry, four mana target creature can't be blocked this turn. It's when he says it does it all because when I, I've, you know, I haven't watched every Doctor Who episode, but I've watched a few. Yeah. And uh, every time I'm like, yeah, that screwdriver does everything. Yeah, that, that's that's for sure the design here. <laughs> As they were like, well, this is sort of the every tool. It's the uh, pocket knife of space and so, time. So every set now has a three mana rock that we have to ask, does this clear the bar to for playable? Yeah. Three mana rock. And this one, this is often how they try and tackle it. Like give it a couple of other, other abilities. Stuff, yeah. So the scry one's too expensive. If you're paying three mana to scry, you're losing. And you scry one. If this was scry two... Even then. E Why didn't they make it scry two? That seems fine. Totally yeah, scry, fair. Totally fair. Yeah. And and then at least it does what you're looking for. It's like an emergency button that kind of fixes your stuff. draws. Yeah. Like scry one is terrible. If you just top, you're like, ugh. Uh, yeah, I paid three mana for a third of a card. No yeah. thanks. Mm. Four mana target creature can't be blocked this turn. So that's on raid for what, what like Rogue's Rogue Pass Passage and that kind of thing that we're already playing. I don't play a lot of Rogue's Passage anymore, but... People do, and I've certainly died to it. Yep. Uh, two mana untap another target artifact is pretty high. Uh, yeah, Voltaic Key is the comparison that costs one mana. Yeah, I mean, this costs one mana, and but like you are, you're tapping the mana rock, so it, you're it does cost you two mana. It does cost you two mana. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, technically, yeah. Yeah. It's none of the things it does are good as far as like what we would want to pay but the fact that you have those choices and also the base of like mm -hmm. it just taps for mana like you want two of these and I, it feels like you want to be able to untap you want to want to untap artifacts and you sort of want to want to make something unblockable because you're you're less likely to want to scry one <laughs> For three. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be. Even in, the, even in those scry decks? No, I don't think you're paying three to scry. <laughs> yeah, even in the decks that are like, hey, instead of scrying, just draw. It, you're, you'd still look at this and be like, but do I want to pay three to draw one? Yeah, I don't really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I might do it, but I don't like it. I am losing. <laughs> yeah. I'm not planning to do this. So you need artifacts that want to be untapped, and you also want to sometimes make things unblockable, or vice versa. Yeah, I, I feel like you kind of want both. Otherwise, they're just too expensive for both of those and you're just not going to activate either and then you're playing a manolith. Yeah, it just sounds like another three mana rock that in very narrow situations might be playable but for most, 
you know, 95% of decks, you just don't run it. Yeah. Okay. This That's next one bad. is so cool. Yeah. This one's a little crazy. I love it. It's I called, don't know where it goes. Yeah, it's weird. The Flood of Mars. Two blue blue for a 3-3 three, three alien zombie horror. It has Island Walk, and it also has Water Always Wins, which means whenever the Flood of Mars attacks, put a flood counter on another target creature or land. If it's a creature, it becomes a copy of the Flood of Mars. If it's a land, it becomes an island in addition to its other types. In addition. So remember, you do this, you turn some... You might be thinking, oh, sweet, I'll turn their commander into a Flood of Mars, which is good, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Now they don't have their commander. But they have a Flood of Mars, so when they attack, they put a Flood counter on something. I'll turn your commander into a Flood yes, of Mars. Yes, make sure that you don't mind if your commander's not on the battlefield or working when you do this. And yeah. now you've got two, and... You turn two things into floods, and it is a flood, right? Like it just slowly yeah. takes over. And then you're like, cool, I have enough that I want to attack. When I attack, I'm going to turn that into an island, and you can't block these things. Yeah. Which, by the way, if you gave somebody else a flood of Mars, they can... You pr presumably already have islands have anyway. Islands, so it's unblockable So you want to be giving an you? island walk thing to everybody? So you're, yeah, I don't know if you want to give everyone three threes that you can't block. <laughs> like, that seems pretty dangerous. Yeah, but I mean, if their commander's like Corvold or something, you're like, I just don't want you to have those abilities. Yeah, it's... Put a flood counter on another target creature or land. So you can choose a thing that already has a counter on it. Yeah. Uh, the flood counters don't actually do anything. So if you move flood counters, nothing happens. It's yeah. just a way to mark just a the marker, cards. Yeah. yeah. So it feels like the play pattern for this because I was thinking about, I was like, I don't think it's ever right to turn something into an island unless you have a ton of these. Right. Like it, it's just, that's the last one. Maybe so, you've got carpet flowers out. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there you go. That combo. Is it's, Carpet of Flowers in this deck? No. It's in one of them. That's in the bad guy deck. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to tell because they all have blue in them. Yeah. I feel like the first attack, you want to turn one of your things into a flood. Isn't okay. that weird? Yeah, but no, you're right. Because like, then the next attack, you can turn two things. Two, you turn two things. And it gets like exponentially impactful. And you definitely don't want to just give them a bunch of things you can't block. So it... The only place I can think of it going is a token deck where you're like turning your tokens into this, turning more tokens into this, turning, but it's just a three, three. I wish it was like a four, four, and then it could like tuffle, tussle a little bit. Yeah. It's going to take a long time to kill them. They're not going to let, it's going to take so, it takes forever. And you, then, yeah. I wish you could move flood counters and like. It should be ETB and attack. Like give us one on ETB and then at least you have two for your attack. Then you've got a cool attack. Yeah. But it doesn't do anything until it attacks. <laughs> you're like. <laughs> it it doesn't the stuff doesn't change back after this dies oh yeah no it's that now yeah so, so the, it's a removal spell the thing i thought was like if you have a deck and it's not super reliant on its commander yeah then this actually becomes pretty good because mm -hmm. what's likely to happen is you attack you turn a commander into one of these, mm -hmm. and then everyone starts turning the most important stuff into these. Right. And you're like, well... I don't have any important co co creatures. Yeah. My my commander doesn't matter to my strategy as much, and I haven't put my key pieces out yet, and hopefully they're not creatures, mm -hmm. in which case your plan is more likely to stay intact than your opponent's. And I could see that being an interesting... I've talked about this in the past, yeah. how like... I was like, what if your commander is a planeswalker, but then you, they, you have island walks, so you, like, yeah, they, can, just they can just kill it. your planeswalker. Yeah, that part's not good. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, maybe you have Xurnorb, you can sack the islands. There you go. Yeah. But I, I think that is where I would lean towards. Mm -hmm. If I looked at my deck and I, I thought, well, my plan is mostly in enchantments and artifacts, and my commander's not super important to it. It adds value or it gives me colors or whatever it's doing. Well, this is a really disruptive card to have on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. They will have to deal with this. And the cool thing is they don't even have to deal with you doing it after you turn the first thing. Yeah. If they remove that, you've already turned. There's already a flood out. Yeah. A it board wipe like, kind of stops it. Yeah. But yeah, besides that, it's just going to like, oh, but I've got one and I'll attack and I'll turn that into a thing. And it's like, okay. Yeah. And because of the island walk, they almost always have a free attack and you don't have to turn the thing. There's nothing on that says, you know target of the person you're attacking right so anybody with an island you attack them and then you turn whatever you want into one mm -hmm. of, you know either an island or yeah so th it's like a very narrow usage but i think there are probably some decks where like i'll just play this as a disruptor to the game mm -hmm. it's it's cool with a go deck maybe oh like if you're consistently making it so that your opponents can't attack you that's interesting then you're like all right 
Now everybody has an un- unblockable islands against each other. So like you, then you do care about everyone having an island. But the problem is they can still turn your stuff into the floods of Mars. Right, yeah. But then so, you're like, whatever. Now I attack with six of them. Yeah. And I turn all your creatures into them, and you still go it or whatever. <laughs> it's a bizarre <laughs> chaos deck. <laughs> yeah, I don't think this I, card is good, but it's probably going to be hilarious so when it comes down. It's yeah. such a fun card, and I want to take a take a minute to talk about it. It is definitely too good if it ETPs and turns something else yeah, into it because then you good. can't kill it. Yeah. Then you, you like stop there's it. no yeah there's no way to also, stop. Also, if it. you have uh, a lot of protection for your commander, you got swift boots, lightning greaves, a couple mm-hmm. other things. It just has hexproof natu- natural. Yeah, so you're like, cool. I got boots on, and now I go. I turn your commander into a thing, and you can't target mine. So <laughs> have fun, everybody. It's not the worst. This is another like look over here. Problem. Plus, you can swift boots onto it, attack the turn you play it, and then Ooh. swift boots back or greaves back. Yeah. It's such a mess. I love it. I want to play. I love just, a messy magic yeah, card. Yeah, I want to play just for the discussion it'll cause at the table because there will yeah. be a lot of bargaining. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I love a pillow fort deck. Definitely a goad deck. If you're not relying around your commander, try it out. Tell us how how it affects your games. <laughs> Okay, this next one's cool. It's another saga. It's the flux. We've talked about the impending flux. This is the flux itself. Uh, It's not impending anymore. It's (laughs) just here. here. Two red red for a saga. The first chapter says the flux deals four damage to target creature and opponent controls. Second chapter, third chapter, fourth chapter, and fifth chapter all say exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. And the sixth chapter says add six red mana. There's a cycle of these sagas where they have multiple chapters that kind of do the same thing or do things yeah. based on how many chapters it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. These are like long chapters or, or sagas are very powerful yeah. because it just becomes like it just is there for the rest of the game. And what I like about this card is is commander players play Outpost, Siege, and Visions of Phyrexia. They're not my favorite cards, but they see plenty of play. Yeah. And what I don't like about playing those cards is they're four mana enchantments that come down and on your upkeep, you'll impulse draw one. Yeah. It's really like you do nothing with that turn and then you don't even get your payoff for like three turns down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And this card doesn't. It's four mana, ETB, Kill kill a thing. And four mana deal four damage to a creature isn't a great rate. But like we said, it kills 65 to like ish percent of of commanders it kills 62 percent of relevant top 100 creatures on eda trek um so it comes in it is an expensive removal spell kills something and then you get one two three four five impulse draws off of it four impulse draws off of it excuse me yeah and six mana is a lot and likely a win the game turn that you're going to yeah. start saving up for. They'll they'll be planning for that turn. Mm-hmm. They'll try and deal with that before this because mana geysers and Jessica's wills win the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that about it too and I think it actually makes it Visions of Phyrexia was the one I compared it to the most because it does do a little something which is give you a, a power something. stone the first yeah. time that it comes in play which is not crazy because you figure a two mana rock you would yeah. play Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not exactly two mana rock power stones are limited in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can only use them for certain things, but still I like that. I don't play outpost siege anymore. Um, and have them for a while, but visions of Phyrexia, I think is defensible. You can play it. It's a little slow. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a much better turn to like, be like, kill your commander and have this enchantment. Mm-hmm. That's a totally like, that's, that's a pretty awesome. powerful thing. It's going to slow them down one player down enough hopefully the player that's in the most lead or whatever to allow you to realize the card advantage that you're going to get and get to that mana, the, the Jessica's will mana guys are mm-hmm. ritual thing at the end. Yeah. If you can proliferate, you can draw multiple cards a turn. That's it's pretty sweet. It's but. not mana guys. I shouldn't say that. It's not 20 mana, but yeah, six, is, six is a lot. Um, I feel like almost any deck of it knew, like in two turns, you're going to get six or mana can set up a win condition. Now yeah. your opponents will interact and try and stop it, but still that's very powerful. The big thing I don't like about visions of Phyrexia is if I'm playing an impulse draw engine, I, most of my deck has impulse charge engines and I don't get the power stone if I've like cast this spell from exile, for example. True. So it's true. like, I like the flux because it, it does a thing for sure. It gives you the value on that. And then it just hangs out. And if somebody spends a removal spell in the flux to dodge that six ma- red mana, you're like, great. Totally. I've already it's drawn, fine. I already I've drawn got a stuff. card. Yeah. I've removed a thing. This is great. Uh, the other downside of outpost siege and visions is, Late game, you draw them on turn eight or nine. There's not enough time left in the game to yeah. sort of realize the advantage. But at late game, you often still do want to kill a commander. In fact, yeah. you often need to because you're like, well, I can't win. They're probably going to then. Mm. It, if I can kill one key thing, that will make it so they can't win on their turn. And that therefore buys me a turn. So, Yep. I think this card's cool. All right. Okay. Another saga. And it's in that same cycle. It is Trial of a Time Lord. One white, white. 
The first three chapters are all the same. Exile target non-token creature and opponent controls until Trial of a Time Lord leaves the battlefield. And then chapter four is starting with you. Each player votes for innocent or guilty. If guilty gets more, more votes, the owner of each card exiled with Trial of a Time Lord puts that card on the bottom of their library. This card's so funny. <laughs> it's a trial. Yeah, it so is it's a like, trial. You, I accuse you <laughs> and you. Now we're going to have a trial. Yeah. I mean, you have to choose a uh, non-symmetrical amount of stuff, yes. right? The weird thing about this is you need three guilty votes to exile all of them, which means oh, you a and goes because to, it's a tie, tie goes to innocent. If guilty gets more votes, oh crap. So you need to convince everybody except one player, which Ugh. is what I don't like about this card. It should have said if guilty gets you, the equal or more votes. So yeah. if you can get one player to agree. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's tough because that means that you have to remove three things that belong to one player, basically, or two things and maybe one that they will let go to keep those two things gone. Yeah. So like if this comes down and removes a creature and then you have to play politics because you need to win that vote or they come back or you keep removing counters from it, I guess, if you're doing a saga thing, but it removes three things slowly. Yeah, you compare the obvious comparison is Grasp of Fate, mm -hmm. which comes in and you exile one thing from each opponent. Right. So you get the three right away, mm -hmm. which in some ways is much more powerful, but also in other ways is less powerful. I think of sort of the game theory response that your opponents have to have once this card hits the battlefield. You you exile probably the most powerful thing. Yep. But it's going to be like, okay, well, I know on their next turn they're going to exile probably what's the most po powerful thing. So whatever I play probably shouldn't look like the most powerful thing. And mm -hmm. so it will alter their play patterns in a really interesting way, which I think there's some advantage to that. How to quantify that is hard to tell. But uh, the other thing that I'm just realizing, sorry, yeah. uh, you can hit commander and they can choose to either put their commander on trial or keep it locked in there or send it to the command zone. It says non-token. Oh. So you can like, if you send commander, they send it to the command zone. You don't need to worry about the vote. Right. Cause it doesn't matter. And they might, have to because they might have to. otherwise you lock it in there forever yeah if if there's they if don't get there's another a chance later. verdict no it stays so it feels like if you exile the commander with this they have to send it back to the command zone otherwise it's like yeah oh uh, yeah I, I otherwise you just lose your commander first of all for for two to three more turns and then you're putting your whole commander on the line for this vote it makes it a lot easier to target one player because you come in you target player you know you target jimmy's commander mm -hmm. he puts it in the command zone yeah because even because jimmy's going well i don't want to wait three turns and also i don't want the chance that this gets locked up forever yeah and then with chapters two and three you you know you target ladies mm -hmm. two permanents and now the vote comes up and there's only ladies two permanents under there and They're like, yeah, guilty. jimmy the problem is if it's jimmy he'll vote with lady <laughs> But if it's a reasonable, normal person... If it has Josh's two permanents under there, <laughs> guilty! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, you would you see what I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah, it's a lot easier. And you did get rid of, three, you know, three, three things, things from two people. Yeah. I so you do get to split part. it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's cool. I think it's an e-card. It's very slow, but I think it's great in Saga decks when you can turn... like The slowness could be an clock. upside, though. I really think there's often times in games... You, we've all been there where we're like, you have that card, and therefore I've been holding these cards in my hand because yeah. I cannot play them because you'll just for free kill that stuff or take it. Grasp of Fate is definitely one of those annoying cards where you're like, all right, I'll kill your best thing, which I'm scared of. I'll kill your best thing, which is good. And I, that, I'll take your signet. Yeah. Uh, and but that often is, yeah. is fine, too, because you don't actually make the third player as mad because they know, well, you got to do it. You got to kill the other Yeah, whereas this yeah. one, you are choosing each thing. So yeah. each thing you choose, potentially. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you can manipulate counters, this is amazing, though. Yeah. Because you can just keep it in play. And exile keep a thing things. every turn is insane. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool card. Uh, a lot of cool sagas in this set, which I am into. Yeah, I actually think Trial of Time Lord is pretty playable at that at that rate. I think, I, cool. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna use it because also if you are decent at politics, you should be able to work your way through talking to the table mm. to a whatever I'm getting, they're gone forever. We, right. we we've agreed, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you get to say guilty. <laughs> <laughs> that consecrated sphinx. You get to say things like objection. Objection. And sustained. Yeah. <laughs> Ton of fun. <laughs> I'm in for that. <laughs> All right. One final card we're going to talk about today, and it's been spoil spoiled the longest. It's Weeping Angel. Uh, one blue black for an artifact creature, Alien Angel. This is a 2-2 with flash and first strike and vigilance. Whoa. 
Whenever an opponent casts a creature spell, Weeping Angel isn't a creature until end of turn. If Weeping Angel would deal combat damage to a creature, prevent that damage, and that creature's owner shuffles it into their library. This is the best episode of Doctor Who that I've ever seen. It's very sweet. Yeah, this is from Blank. Yeah. Um, and canonically, like these things, if you look at them, they can't move. But if as soon as you stop look at looking at them, they're gonna like gonna shoot you, you into space and time. Yeah, they're, like they you're flash banished. you way back in time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the flavor here is incredible. And play pattern wise, I think it's pretty sweet. If somebody attacks you, you flash this out, like you block, you hit first strike, shuffle their commander away. And now you have this like annoying 2-2 two, two with first strike and vigilance that just means they have to attack, cast a creature first first main in order for it to Go not away. be able to block so they can attack you. It's a very annoying attacker. Like you just can't block this thing and it is vigilance. I love this thing. I love blocking. It's, this is a this is a, just a, a really annoying blocker. It's so obnoxious. Yeah. And it's a free combat damage trigger most of the time. Like you cannot block this thing. And you really don't want to remove it because you have ways around it. I just have to cast a creature first. Yeah, I don't want to spend it. All I have to do is first main, cast a creature, and then I can attack. Yeah. But yeah, if you don't just... have a creature, it's so annoying. <laughs> I think this card is one of those that it's going to see play. It's, as soon as it's in play, it's going to do way more work than you ever would have seen. Yeah, you're going to be like, I couldn't attack them. Like basically the whole game because yeah. I couldn't afford to shuffle my thing in. Or like I just wanted to cast spells. Like I didn't, I'm playing an yeah. instant or sorcery deck. I don't, I'm playing an artifact deck. I don't have creatures to like make this thing. Yeah, the thing here is it has first strike. So it deals its damage, right? And then yeah. the thing gets shuffled in. So it doesn't die. Yeah. That's the first strike is really what makes this like insane. And also it is a vigilant flyer. So you're just like, cool. It doesn't fly. Oh, it's I not. know it has big wings, but it's a stack. Oh, it has flash. First, not flying. first strike flash vigilance. I thought it had flying. I know. It's flying would be strikes. unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Well, still awesome, but less yeah. awesome, but still awesome. It's still super sweet. This is the kind of card I love. get one creature. On. Yeah, exactly. It is a removal spell on yeah. somebody attacking you. And I Which love that. It's a little narrow. Like, you know, attacking early for value isn't always a thing in Commander. Some of us just always get attacked, so we're used yeah. to it, yeah. But even on end step, you could flash <laughs> it in and just have this really annoying blocker. You held up in your It banner. is interesting how it's probably just better for me. Yeah. Because I, I'm you're getting the attacked default all the time. get attacked person. <laughs> so, but that's fine, because I would like yeah. to establish that, like, oh, but if you do that, it might go badly for you. So maybe stop doing it. It's also so bad. <laughs> like, it gets shuffled. Yeah. It doesn't die, which in graveyard decks, you're like, I'm fine with it. Dies. Shuffle is the worse than, it's probably the worst removal. Like, yeah. Like I mean, exile, exile, yeah, exile, exile. is stronger than yeah, that. Yeah. But like, think it's, it's way worse than kill. It's way worse, worse than, than bounce. bounce. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's so not. It's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> I love this card. I think it's really fun. I think it's going to do way more work than you, uh, it says on its card. That's cool. All right. <laughs> That is going to do it for yeah. our Doctor Who in the 99 episode. As always, we're going to wrap up by naming our favorite card and mm -hmm. then what we think is the most powerful card. Hold on. I didn't I didn't pick a most powerful, but I, yeah. I just needed to find the name of it. Well, I my favorite is, is twofold because there's a lot of design that I really, really love in this set. Um, there's a lot of cards that make me laugh. There's a lot of cards that make me want to see them in play. And yeah. like, they make cool moments. I think trial of time Lord is like a really fun removal spell. Um, but displaced dinosaur makes dinosaur nuggets. <laughs> and, so uh, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to make all of my legendaries also dinosaurs. I am like, <laughs> it is definitely the coolest design and it allows, yeah. you know, a lot of things where you're like, well, that it's like stuff we've never seen. Yeah, you're yeah. like, what happens if I make this a dinosaur? Yeah, holy crap! My planeswalker could be a seven-seven. Also, what Wait, happens? I like uh, I like that Holland and Elena are two individual women yeah. and also a, a single dinosaur. dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really cool card. It's cool. Really cool design. Yep. Um, I think mine is bigger on the inside. Yeah. It just, I, I don't think it's the most powerful or anything, but there's stuff I like to do in Magic and untapping and <laughs> tapping things is one of them so i think there's a lot of shenanigans mm -hmm. i would like to get up to of taking whatever permanent this is on and tapping it to add the mana then untapping it and tapping it a couple of times so that the next uh, spell i cast maybe cascades mm -hmm. multiple times or i get this effect on you know every player's turn with a seedborn muse or something like that again it's not the most powerful but it could be powerful in the right spots and those tend to be spots that uh, i think you know, are the type of gameplay that, that I like. So yeah, that's my pick. What do you uh, think is the most powerful card from Doctor Who? Um, for me, it's probably Flesh Duplicate. It's not a super exciting pick, but that's the kind of card that 
it's going to make most decks better. It's really easy to slot into a deck. It's a two mana clone that you're going to have for three turns. You can blink it. You can reanimate it. You can enchant it if that's what your deck's doing. Um, it's, yeah, it, I think that's the stapliest card for it, this set. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say Flesh Duplicate. I think the other one I was thinking about is um, Everybody Lives. Everybody Lives was definitely on the table. Yeah. I think there will probably be some stuff you can do with it that we haven't thought of yet that mm -hmm. make it pretty powerful. But yeah, Flesh Duplicate. It's almost, it's very hard for the most powerful card from a set to not be like two mana, maybe three at the most. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you could do it. Everybody Lives in response to a Bolus as Citadel. Wow, and then they can't activate it because they can't. They, they pay can't the pay. Life. They can't pay life off of it, so I don't think they can cast anything. It'll be interesting to see if a lot of enough of those fringe cases exist mm -hmm. to kind of push it its power level up. It, it undoubtedly has a very powerful effect on the game. Yeah. So it does be, a lot for two mana. At its yeah, there'll be a lot of things where like only this card would have made you know me able to win this game mm -hmm. because it just interacted in a really weird axis. But there'll be a lot of times I think as well where it's like. This card doesn't interact how I would like it to and therefore was just kind of rotting in my hand. Yeah. So that's why I think I would go with Flesh Duplicate. Yep. Because it'll always do what it's going to do. It, yeah, which it'll is be super efficient. It'll, it'll be. <laughs> yeah. It'll duplicate. And also Flesh. <laughs> uh, to the listeners, are you a Doctor Who fan? Does this set live up to your imagination? This is the last episode where we're talking about Doctor Who stuff. So uh, let us know what you think about the set overall, but also what new cards slot perfectly into your existing Commander decks. What's your favorite? What do you think is the most powerful? Let us know in the comments below. And of course, you're going to want to get your hands on all these cards. And to do that, the best place to go is cardkingdom.com slash command. You are a magic player. You want to buy magic cards. You may as well go to Card Kingdom, which is the best place to buy them and support our content at the same time. Card Kingdom has a huge inventory. They're going to have the cards you're looking for in the condition you're looking for, in the version that you're looking for. And once you add everything to the cart for your brand new deck, they're going to put everything into one singular package, put that in the mail, and that is going to arrive on your doorstep quickly and all at once, which is super convenient because I hate waiting for like the last four or five cards to show up because it's like I can't quite play the deck yet, but most of it's there, <laughs> which is super frustrating. So cardkingdom.com slash command, the best place to go to buy all your magic products and singles, everything. And once those cards are in your hand, you're going to need to go to ultrapro.com slash command to protect them. Go get some sleeves, some play mats, some deck boxes, binders. Keep an eye out for their big sales. Every so often, I'll just be like, I guess I need three binders because they're half off today. Yep. Uh, and we're always acquiring more magic cards. We're always building new decks. So you always need a new pair of sleeves, a new deck box, and it's great to pick them up all in the same place from a brand you trust. Go check out those apex sleeves. They are really sweet. I can't wait. So I can buy a whole bunch of them. Honestly, yeah. uh, my decks need new sleeves and I don't I'm literally them waiting enough. on the apex sleeves. Yeah. Like I know there's like, you know, my oldest five or six decks that they've been in the same eclipse sleeves for like five years now. Right. And five years is a long time. I'm yeah, ready. they get gross. Yeah, I'm ready to get new sleeves. So I'm like, Apex sleeves are coming. There's no way I'm going to, you know, yeah. put these in sleeves and then change it in a couple months. So mm -hmm. Ultra Pro, Apex, com. let us know when. Ultrapro.com slash command. Also, follow us on TikTok. We're putting out some cool stuff. Uh, we're hopefully going to make some new content for that. We've got shorts. We've got reels on Instagram. We are making short form content. Go check it out. Follow us on TikTok. We appreciate it so much. All right. And before we go, big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone, which is Damon Lenz, Eric Lem, Medi Megan Yip, Gaurav Galati, Jordan Pridgen, Jamie Block, Arthur Meadowcroft, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Limberger, Craig Munchett, Katie Cole, Mitch Trafford, Gabriel Pozos, and of course, the ineffable Jimmy Wong. Thanks right. for listening, everybody. Thanks. And uh, we'll be back soon because it's almost time to talk Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Oh, my God. It's like tomorrow. Yeah. It's like tomorrow it's coming out. We, uh, we have had a chance to look at the set already. It looks sweet. It looks, I, I've played a little limited even here in the office. I, and the mechanics are cool. Yeah. Ixalan was my first set. That's where I started Magic. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to be back. And I know one of their emphasis is, uh, was to make this, you know, powerful mm. this time around because that was one of the complaints about Ixalan. So, and the cards look powerful. It looks really cool. So very yep, cool. we will see you very soon. Bye. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. 
or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>